Ujama, Ujama, I want to jama with you. Okay. Ujama, 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 and I hope you like Ujama too. I don't know. Did you guys hear my song? <laughs> you can tell me to stop singing. I don't know what this guy's problem. But you understand. All right. Anyway, so let's go. Number seven: Socialism and Rural Development. Um, have me some breakfast. Traditional African family lived according to the basic principles of Ujama. Uh, it remember its members did this unconsciously. Oh, and the reason why I'm going to try to read quickly is because this one's long. Its members did this unconsciously and without any conception of what they were doing in political terms. They lived together and worked together because that was how they understood life and how they reinforced each other against the difficulties they had to contend with, the uncertainties of weather and sickness, the depredations of wild animals and sometimes human enemies, and the cycle of life and death. The results of their joint efforts were divided unequally between them, but according to well-understood customs. And the division was always on the basis of the fact that every member of the family had to have enough to eat, some simple coverings, and a place to sleep, before any of them, even the head of the family, had anything extra. The family members thought of themselves as one, and all their language and behavior emphasized their unity. The basic goods of life were our food, our land, our cattle. An identity was established in terms of relationships, mother and father, or so-and-so, of so-and-so, daughter of so-and-so, wife of such-and-such a person. They lived together and they worked together, and the result of their joint labor was the property of the family as a whole. This is a beautiful, um, this is a beautiful sentiment, beautiful share. Uh, this was a traditional African family, and he's like, look, you know, you were son of so-and-so. Like, in fact, I remember this. I was at this uh, event. I went to this brother I haven't seen in, like, I want to say 10 years, and I'm like, isn't your mother so-and-so? Now, if I remember correctly, his mother might have passed away. I don't know. But he was like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, because I saw him when he was like a young buck. Now, it could be he was a different guy. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, like, that's, um, that's, that's just how we are, you know? Uh, our food, our land, our cattle. But, again, like, how this is compatible with industrial economies is not really clear. But from a basic rural village economy, like, this is beautiful, you know and uh, you know and that's the only that's the only issue it's like do you take this and make it into um an industrial thing and then how do you do that and i think that's the question that a lot of our ancestors uh were trying to ask or trying to answer <clears throat> all right so the assumptions of traditional ujama living so the pattern of living was made possible because of three basic assumptions of traditional life these assumptions were not questioned or even thought about but the whole society was both based upon them and designed to uphold them. They permeated the customs, manners, and education of the people, and although they were not always honored by every individual, they were not challenged. Rather, the individual continued to be judged by them. Um, the first of these basic assumptions or principles of life I have sometimes described as love. But that word is so often used to imply a deep personal affection that it can give a false impression. A better word is perhaps respect. For it was and is really a recognition of mutual involvement in one another and may or may not involve any affection deeper than that of familiarity. Every member of the family recognized the place and the rights of the other members. And although the rights varied according to sex, age and even ability and character, there was a minimum below which no one would, no one could exist without disgrace to the whole family. Even the most junior wife in a polygamous household had respect due to her. She had a right to her own house in a relation, and in relation to her husband, and she had full access to the joint products of the family group. There was also due to her and from her a family loyalty. So, you know, you could obviously see, um, yeah, that he's recognizing, um, at least there were, there were some polygamous households, we all know that. Um, but even the junior wife would get respect for it. So he's like, I, I would get respect. And he's like, each member uh, recognize the place and the rights of other members and so on and so forth. Um, and, and yeah, how everybody had like, a, like essentially like he's like, hey, like the minimum wage was a living wage. You know what I mean? Um, but not just wage, but just the minimum um, acquisition, the minimum distribution was a living distribution, living, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, while the first principle of the Ujamaa unit related to persons, the second related to property, it was that all the basic goods were held in common and shared among all members of the unit. There was an acceptance that whatever one person had in the way of basic necessities 
they all had. No one could go hungry while others hoarded food, and no one could be denied shelter if others had space to spare. Within the extended family, and even within the tribe, the economic level of one person could never get too far out of proportion to the economic level of others. That was not complete equality. Some individuals within the family and some families within the clan or tribe could own more than others, but in general they acquired this through extra efforts of their own, and the social system was such that in time of need it was available to all. Further, the inheritance systems were such that in almost all places death led to the dispersal of, for example, a large herd of cattle among a large number of people. Inequalities existed, but they were tempered by comparable family or social responsibilities, and they could never become gross and offensive to the social equality, which was the basis of the communal life. Yeah, and so this is interesting. You know, this is interesting because why? You know, basically, he's talking about the property rights in Africa as far as um, as far as he wants to describe it. You know what I mean? Um, and essentially, you you would want to juxtapose this and contrast this with the Western um, uh, the Western property rights. Um, one of the things that the Westerns have the Westerners have is called primogeniture, right? And um, I think it's primogeniture, but I think it's I don't know if I if I know what it is really. But what I'm thinking of is this idea that they have where you would leave everything to like the first son. And what that does is it makes, you know, wealth generation, like wealth generation after generation kind of be maintained in a certain, um, at least a, a certain family unit. Whereas this sort of, um, you know, disperse it over plenty of children. What that does is that it kind of makes it so that you wouldn't generate wealth. You know what I mean? Um, which is fine, but again, like if you require wealth um, in order to make more wealth, uh, what happens is that yeah, you know, the Wazungu can probably run away with his wealth based off of his own principles, whereas um, Africans would probably not um, run away with wealth like that. And then, like, what happens is that when the Industrial Revolution um, occurs in, in Europe, it like puts the Europeans to this far advantage. Uh, because Africans will not be able to, um, like, compete in the industrial sense. And, like, we kind of still see that to this day, which is realistically, you know, a problem, you know? So that that's another thing that we want to be mindful of as we look at how Africa was. Uh, it's another thing we want to be mindful of. All right. And then finally, and a necessary third principle was the fact that everyone had an obligation to work. The work done by different people was different, but no one was exempt. Every member of the family and every guest who shared in the right to eat and have shelter took it for granted that he had to join in whatever work had to be done. Only by the universal acceptance of this principle was the contribution, was the continuation of the other two made possible. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so this everyone has to work thing. Um, again, like, how does this compete? How, how is this compatible with wage labor? Because, see, the thing with that we have to realize about these earlier. Like this village life is that, or a lot of life before the um, quote unquote industrialization, whatever, or before towns, let's say, wasn't wage, you know, wasn't paid labor, you know, so the, so the, so the, 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 the junior wife wasn't paid per se. You get what I'm saying? Uh, like if, if you're, if you're a self reliant, self sufficient people, you don't pay one another. Now, you can distribute things so that everybody is eating well and everybody's doing well. And, you know, you respect everybody for their role, like he says, or you love everybody for their role or or everybody has enough property for themselves. They have enough shelter. They have enough food. And if, if your neighbor needs food, you're not going to say, well, starve, you dumbass. Right. You're going to just, you know, give them to them. And then everybody's going to work and so on and so forth. But this is without any wages. Now, as soon as you go into the cities in the towns, because you're going to have cities and towns, uh, even in traditional African societies, right? You know, the Yoruba and so on and so forth, right? When you have cities and towns, these rules are no longer a thing. And I think that's one of the things that we... Not, not, not one of the issues is that we tend to associate this loss with being European, when realistically speaking, this loss really uh, might have to deal with being... Um, like being in towns. And, and not to say that, well, the, the property right was actually pretty um, good for, like pretty unique to Africa. Well, not unique, unique, but, you know, pretty 
um, different from Europe. Um, but what happens there is, uh, but like, like, but like, that's like one of the intricacies that you do want to expand upon as an African people. And, and we can go into that. Um, never. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, we, we, we can like uh, look into that. So the inadequacies of the traditional system. But although these three principles were at the base of the traditional practice of Ujamaa, the result was not the kind of life which we really wish to see existing throughout Tanzania. Quite apart from personal failures to live up to the ideals and principles of the social system, a traditional Africa was no more composed of unselfish and hardworking angels than any other part of the world. There were two basic factors which prevented traditional society from full flowering. The first of these was that, although every individual was joined to his fellows by human respect, there was in most parts of Tanzania an acceptance of one human equality. Uh, human inequality. Although we try to hide the fact, and despite the exaggeration which our critics have frequently indulged in, it is true that the women in traditional society are regarded as having a place in the community which was not only different, but was also to some extent inferior. So, you know, you're going to see the modern um, modern feminism kind of thing, but it's okay. Um, I don't, like, you know, like, again, I don't, I don't mind. It is impossible to deny that the women did and still do more than their fair share of the work in the fields and in the homes. So he's he's going to tell you that like and that's that's a thing that a lot of Europeans observed. Now, I'll say this: when I was reading Job, Job put it that one of the reasons why women seemed to be working more was because men lost their roles. You know, so it's like if I'm um, if as a man I should be patrolling the streets, but then Wazungu comes in and says you're not patrolling your streets anymore. Uh, the reality is that if the woman was you know, working the field while I was patrolling the streets, but I no longer can patrol the streets, then she's still working the field. You get what I'm saying? And so it would look like she's doing more work because essentially I became unemployed. Now, people might say, well, why don't the guy just go and do the work in the field? Um, but I think there was like a, a taboo against men doing like women's work. You know what I mean? Uh, so so it's, it's a little bit complicated. But anyway, let's go. By virtue of their sex, they suffered from inequalities, which had nothing to do with their contribution to the family welfare. Although it is wrong to suggest that they have always been an impressed group, it is true that within traditional society, ill treatment and enforced observance could be their lot. That is certainly inconsistent with our socialist conception of the equality of all human beings and the right of all to live in such security and freedom as is consistent with equal security and freedom of all others. If we want our country to make full and quick progress now, it is essential that our women live on terms of full equality with their fellow citizens who are men. So again, like, you know, this is another one of those, you know, like Western concepts in a sense, um, repackaged towards us. You know, you do want some sort of gender roles, um, mostly because we as human beings are, like we as, we as uh, human beings are different. You know, and you don't want to force an equality where there's unnecessary inequality, you know, or like even say on a hormonal level. Right. I as a man um, am just like like I could get more aggressive, you know, on average. Now, obviously, there are going to be women who have aggression beyond my aggression. Right. And there's obviously going to be. Um, yeah, there's, there's going to be like exceptions, but. Um, the reality is that on an, on an average basis, you know, uh, you would you would expect a man to be more aggressive or more willing to kill or more willing to torture, you know, more willing to. Um, uh, I'll say it this way. All right. So, like for instance, I have this son. Um, um, oh, so I said one of the things I liked about the book Roots was this scene where Kunta Kente's father is walking with him to another village, right? I think it might be Jube or something. I don't know. But another village. And he lets his son walk behind him for days or something like that, you know? Or for hours or whatever until his son's feet are, like Kunta Kente's feet are bleeding. And it's like, you wouldn't expect a mother to do that to her son, you know? So, like, I kind of, you know, try to get my son to do, like, stronger things you know things that you know require strength require endurance uh and yet women around me like i was publicly chastised for uh just letting my son like exercise in a sense you know um and that's the thing like i was publicly chastised like women you know men see you making your son exercise 
and they recognize, hey, you know what? As long as you are, you know, as long as you're keeping a guy alive, you know what I mean? He can exercise, right? Uh, like no matter what the exercise is. Um, whereas uh, women will look at it like, no, dude, he's too young. And so it's just a, it's just a lot to um, uh, like, like, like just that that basic gender difference, like just on a hormonal level, uh, just on the testosterone versus estrogen level. Right. Uh, just the recognition that, you know, testosterone will have will impact your personality and estrogen will impact your personality. And whereas men and women will both produce these things um, just on a hormonal level, you would expect a man to have more testosterone and a woman to have less testosterone or a man to have uh, a woman to have more estrogen, a man to have less estrogen. And in that sense, what that would mean, you know, in, in the in the day to day uh then they, they, you know, I guess milieu or whatever, right? Like, as I say, if we're talking about um, the home, like, what, like which, which is better for the home, estrogen or testosterone? You know, on a chemical level, which one's better? And, and that's really, like, what it comes down to. So I, I would say that if you're forcing the men and the women to both operate in a space where uh, that gender imbalance is underutilized, right, like, you might actually cause conflict um that that doesn't necessarily have to um exist like you might you might make it worse than it is right um that was a good explanation but you know <laughs> nobody's here so <laughs> all right so let's see the other aspects of traditional life which we have to break away from is its poverty there you go certainly there was an attractive degree of economic equality but it was equality at a low level you know and there's this uh there's this yuazungu politician who says that the uh the, the the socialists are like that where they want that they, they, they would bring down the average in order to make everything equal whereas um you know the capitalists would would make things more unequal but would bring up the average you know and and like realistically you know you you probably want to decide between actually let's bring up the average notwithstanding inequality you know um, and, and that's that's like realistically like what the what the debate is about. Um, so he says the other aspect of traditional life, which we have to break away from is its poverty. Certainly there was an attractive degree of economic equality, but it was the equality at a low level. The equality is good, but the level can be raised for there was nothing inherent in the traditional system which caused this poverty. It was a result of two things only. The first was ignorance, and the second was the scale of operations. Both of these can be corrected without affecting the validity and applicability of the three principles of mutual respect, sharing of joint production, and work by all. The principles were and are the foundation of human security, of real practical human equality, and of peace between members of society they can also be a basis of economic development if modern knowledge and modern techniques of production are used so the objective this is the objective of socialism in tanzania to build a society in which all members have equal rights and equal opportunities in which all can live at peace with their neighbors without suffering or imposing injustice being exploited or exploiting and in which all have a gradually increasing basic level of material welfare before any individual lives in luxury to create this kind of nation so again like i wouldn't concern myself with people living in luxury um per se now again i'm not a leader in africa so maybe at some point i may um like if i were to be a leader i may be like whoa why is this guy so freaking rich and then i still have poor people around but but of course like anytime i see, like right now at least when i see somebody who's rich i know why they're rich you know they they they're doing something uh, more productive than the other person who isn't doing the same thing you know uh, like like say what you want they're not building like one person's building electric cars uh, <laughs> you know for the planet and the other person is um i guess digging holes for carrots you know and it's like why is the guy digging holes for carrots not as wealthy as the guy who's selling electric cars and it's just like well you know i'm not surprised uh, you know, I'm not. I'm just not surprised. I mean, I think digging holes for carrots is is amazing. I think that's, uh, you know, props to it. But I could see how digging holes for carrots is not going to be as profitable as selling electric cars uh, or state of the art electric cars. I could see that. Um, 
So anyway, to, this, to create this kind of nation, we must build on the fa firm foundations of the three principles of the Ojama family. But we must add to these principles of knowledge and the instruments necessary for the defeat of the poverty which exists in traditional African society. In other words, we must add those elements which allow for increased output per worker and which make a man's effort yield more satisfaction to him. We must take our traditional system, correct its shortcomings, and adapt to its service the things we can learn from the technologically developed societies of other continents. But, but also notice how I just said something about electric cars. Like the system that Nere is outlining, it doesn't speak towards a system. Like it doesn't, it doesn't seem to articulate a system that would develop electric cars. You know, like it's almost opposed to the idea of electric cars. And, and that right there is kind of, is going to be your problem. It's going to be a problem insofar as if you're really trying to escape poverty, but you kind of never encourage any sort of advanced industry, like you're always going to be technologically behind on other people who do. And and and, and I think that's something that we just have to, you know, come face to face with. Uh, Tanzania, as it has been developing in recent years, this is not what has been happening. Our society, our economy, and the dominant ambitions of our own people are all very different now from what they were before the colonial era. There has been a general acceptance of the social attitudes and ideas of our colonial masters. We have to get we have got rid of the foreign government, but we have not yet rid ourselves of the individualistic social attitudes which they represented and taught. For it was from these overseas contexts that we developed the idea that the way to the comfort and prosperity which everyone uh, wants is through selfishness and individual advancement. And of course, under a capitalist style of capitalist type of system, it is quite true that for a few individuals, great wealth and comfort is possible. And even the poorer societies, that is, those societies where the total wealth produced and available in the community is very low, a few individuals can be very wealthy if others are even poorer than they need be. If you abandon the idea and the goal of equality and allow the clever and fortunate to exploit the others, then the glittering prizes of material success will be attracted to all and the temptations of individuals will be further increased. No one likes to be exploited, but all of us are tempted by opportunities to exploit others. Um... One important result of developments over the past 40 years has been the growth of has been the growth of urban centers and of wage employment. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Well, I'll give you guys a commercial. Hold on. This is D-Web with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the pro-black perspective on KWAZ Radio. Yeah, sorry, I had to wipe, uh, I had to, I had to give it to my son. Um... Uh, learning curve says greeting E5. Okay. Um, what's E5? Might be an error. Might be a typo. Greetings E5. All right. Um, okay, so let's see. One important result of development over the past 40 years has been the growth of urban centers and of wage employment. In fact, only about 4% of our people live in towns and less than 340,000 people work for wages out of a total adult population of not less than 5 million. Unfortunately, the life of these tiny minorities has become a matter of great envy for the majority. Life in the towns has become to represent opportunities for advancement, a chance of excitement, and the provision of social services, none of which is easily available in the rural areas. Most of all, there is an almost universal belief that life in the towns is more comfortable and more secure, that the rewards of work are better in the urban areas, and that people in the rural parts of the country are condemned to poverty and insecurity for their whole lives. So and he's kind of looking at it like, hey, look, only 4% of us are in towns. Um, it's like, again, like you don't want to be too much in the present. You kind of want to orient yourself towards the potential future or the, re the real future of, yeah, you probably will 
start to migrate to towns now, uh, particularly as as uh, the agricultural field develops. But although the goal of individual wealth has been accepted by our people, and despite their belief that this can be attained by wage employment and by life in the towns, the truth is that it is an unrealistic goal, especially in Tanzania. The vast majority, even of our town dwellers, live extremely poorly, and in most cases, they are on the whole worse off, both materially and in the realm of personal satisfaction than the people in the rural area could be. An unskilled worker in the towns or on the agricultural estate earns wages which are hardly sufficient to enable a family to eat a proper diet and live in a decent house. Certainly, the concentration of population in a small area makes it essential for the public health reasons that the community should spend more on making clean water available within easy distance of everyone. Certainly, too, the concentration of people makes social life easier and allow adult educational opportunities for adults to be more easily available and more varied. And on the other hand, the life of children outside of school is often extremely bad, unhealthy and dangerous. And for the most and for most people, the ever present threat of unemployment and consequent real hunger is the mist of apparent wealth introduces evils which can be excluded from life in the rural areas if this is based on the traditional principles of African society. So he's saying, look, crime happens if you can't afford school that's going to be bad for the children. Like basically, urban life is kind of low-key rough, notwithstanding it's a small population. Um, that it's, It wasn't necessarily the best uh, either. Now, of course, what you'd want to do is focus on improving that urban life, but, you know, he's he's really convinced of the rural life improvements, which is a good thing. Like, like a lot of us, a lot of us, most of us, even myself, you know, we want Africa to um, improve its agriculture to the point where it is um, self-sufficient in terms of food needs, so so that's that's a that's a must. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't end there. I think that's a first step, and I would continually articulate that as a first step. But I wouldn't end there, um, and I, and that's I think that's the um, the crux of 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 the the difference here. But changes in the rural area. So it is not only through the growth of towns that our society has changed. Uh, let me see the comments. Uh, Learning Curve says, Ella was a typo that's supposed to say, greetings, everyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> greetings, everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew that. I was just messing. Uh, yeah, it is not only the growth of towns that our society has changed. Even in the rural areas, life has been changing over the past 30 years or so. Self-sufficient family farms producing just their own food with enough over to obtain clothing and pay taxes are no longer universal. Even where subsistence agriculture is still practiced, the young and active men have often left the homestead to go to towns or to seek elsewhere for the modern world. Yeah, of course. But the basic difference between Tanzania's rural life now and in the past stems from the widespread introduction of cash crop farming. Um, that's that's another issue. Over large areas of the country, peasants spend at least part of their time, and sometimes a larger part of it, on the cultivation of crops for sale. Crops like cotton, coffee, sisal, pyrethrum, and so on. But, in the process, the old traditions of living together, working together, and sharing the proceeds have often been abandoned. Exactly. Because you can't do it anymore. That's the thing. You can't do it anymore. When you start getting into international trades and so forth you're going to come across inequalities you, you can't like like this 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 dream of oh well if africans just remained subsistence farmers that's nice right but that's that's a social system that has come and gone and i think that's one of the things that you know we have to acknowledge as an african people is that you know the yeah like like the the culture is derivative of the eco economy and if the economy is changing, then you can't you can't maintain the culture, you know. So the question just becomes, what kind of economy should you be forming? And like you can't force the question by forcing the culture is what I would say. Farmers tend to work as individuals in competition and not in cooperation with their neighbors. And in many places, our most intelligent and hardworking peasants have invested their money or money advanced through public credit facilities in clearing more land, extending their acreage, using better tools, and so on, until they have quite important farms of 10, 20, or even more acres. To do this, they have employed other people to work for them. Sometimes, but unfortunately, not always, they have paid the government minimum wages to their laborers for the period over which they were employed. The result has been an increase in production for the nation as a whole, that is, an increase in the amount of wealth produced in Tanzania, and a still further increase in the wealth of man who owned, managed, and initiated the larger farm. And this is what I was telling you guys yesterday about what if my brother, um, like, what if I chose to get better tools? 
and then buy the other people's acreage. Then I would have to then employ other people. And I'm saying this is exactly, this is how the, again, the economy is going to determine the culture. And and the thing is, why would you push back on, like, what are you pushing back on this for? If overall it increases the wealth produced in Tanzania and increases the production of the nation, because one one person is going to um, use what they have to create more wealth, and the other person is going to use. I mean, and I, I said this yesterday. That's the thing. I said this yesterday. You know, I never saw this paper. I never read this book. I've I wasn't alive at this point in time. I haven't even been to this country. But I t- could tell you this is how we're going to behave. This is the logical thing to do. The work of such people is the work of such people as this has shown that in the rural area of Tanzania is possible to produce enough crops to give an agricultural worker a decent life with money for a good house and furniture, proper food, some reserve for old age, and so on. But the moment such a man extends his farm to the point where it is necessary for him to employ laborers in order to plant or harvest the full acreage, then the traditional system of Java has been killed. And that's the thing. That's the thing. You see what I'm saying? Uh, for he is not sharing with other people according to the work they do, but simply paying them in accordance with a laid-down minimum wage. The final output of the farm on which both employer and employees have worked is not being shared. The money obtained from all the crops goes to the owner. From that money, he pays his workers, and the result is that the spirit of equality between all people working on the farm has gone. Exactly. For the employees are the servants of the man who employs them. Thus, we have the beginnings of a class system in a rural area. Also, the employees may well be paid for working during harvest or during wedding, but get no money for the rest of the year. A oh, weeding, sorry, weeding. <laughs> you know, you all know I'm a city boy. <laughs> you know, wedding, and you're like, what? Uh, <laughs> let us take, and, that, and that, that's the thing. It's like you get paid for the work that you do, um, blah, blah, blah. So let us take an example. A common farmer in the lake region who works hard and follows all the rules of good husbandry will probably be able to cultivate three acres of cotton in addition to food crops which just with just the labor of his own family assuming that all members will help to pick when the cotton is ready if he really produces 1500 pounds to an acre right shit right which some people have already exceeded and the price he receives after deduction is 46 cents a pound he'll receive 2000 shillings cash from this, he has only to pay his district taxes, his food is growing, his house is his own, and he has no rent to pay, and so on, right? Um, so basically, he just has one expense, um, and that is the taxes. Everything else he can pocket, right? Apart from a minimum of clothes, repairs to his house, and perhaps very low school fees, the money is at his disposal to spend as he likes. So, you see what I'm saying? I said, I, I gave this example. I said, my brother makes, I just made it up, I was like, makes 100 shillings. And I make 100 shillings. But what do I do with it? You know what I mean? So so if I go and I buy more land, eventually I'll buy so much land that I will need to. But I'll just read it. But it's just it's just amazing. Like, I think I think it's it's something that is, we're just un, like, it's amazing that you could see it before it happens. And then he just tells you and you're like, fudge, you know, like it was obvious. But but you shouldn't be pushing back against this system per se. You know, or if you do, like, understand why there's a pushback on your pushback. Um, the money is at disposal to spend as he likes. Let us now assume that this man decides that the following year he will plant six acres. Okay? So instead of three acres, he does six acres. For this, he and his family will have to work harder. But in addition, they will employ three people during the picking and cleaning for an average period of three months during the year. He will thus have to pay out of his laborers something like 900 shilling. But in return, because he had used them... He and his family will receive another 2,000 shilling. The following year, he will thus have 3,000 shilling to spend as he likes. He can either expand further, perhaps by acquiring a tractor or other improved implements, or he can live better and so on. But the three men whose work at a crucial stage made his extra 1,000 shilling possible will have received between them 900 shillings, and for the rest of the year, they'll have to depend upon other kinds of wage employment or find some other way to getting minimum food. Um, clothes and shelter the one man is progressing very fast and with increasing speed and the other are receiving less than they could receive if they worked on their own account true right um again that's true but 
if you don't have this guy, like basically, who's going to be able to afford a tractor, right? Who's going to be able to afford a tractor if nobody's making 3,000 shillings? Because this guy's making three, these guys are making 300 shillings. Um, and this guy's making 3,000 shillings. So who's going to buy the tractor? <sighs> okay, let's see the comments. Learning curves here. Lenny Curve uh, was on Tanzan's uh, first show. Um, you guys, go make sure you guys check it out. It's pretty good. So, um, Lenny Curve says, what is the purpose of individual wealth accumulation? Are you really happy as a stingy wealth man, wealthy man coming back to a village of poor people? Is the purpose of wealth to escape? Yeah, we have to get into the export business to build an economy and the import business to protect the economy. Yeah. I mean, like like, like what Lenny Curve is asking, it's like, you know, a are you really happy as a stingy, wealthy man coming back? Yeah, I mean, like, I think that this wealthy individual can't afford the, you know, the the, the things that you would need to purchase in the community. Um, if you don't, like, like, like I, I mean, obviously the difference between 2,000 and 3,000 shillings doesn't seem that much. Um, but if you don't get these 3,000 shillings, I feel like you're not going to be able to afford to pay for whatever or like even if you're talking about you want your kids in a in a school like you want to put them into university like if you don't develop savings like the society will have to pay for everything and if the, but if the society cannot afford everything then you like you would want cash so like if you were in a rich society then that would be different um but it, but even if you were in a rich society it just really becomes a question of well how do you still make further distinctions you know um, technically, you know, you would want to like, like, that's the issue. I think the issue is that, uh, Niede is not answering that question of how do you determine distribution of limited resources, right? And limited goods among, a, a, a population, you know, like, how do you do that? So usually you'd say like, let them pay for it. I mean, I guess in a sense you could design another system like a meritocracy, you know, a meritocratic, uh, thing. As I say, like, for instance, who should get the um, the the training to be a surgeon? You know, who should get the who should go to so and so school? Um, one of the questions that I came across, like no, one of the things I came across was that there was uh, Erica Badu was performing in uh, Brooklyn, like uh, maybe like a few days ago. Right. And they were selling tickets. And, you know, some people were trying to resell their tickets or whatever. But basically they were selling tickets for her event. And the question becomes, well, if it were the case that it was like a closed venue of of, of of 50 people, right? 50 people. How, if there's some, some international celebrity, international superstar, right? How do you determine who gets to be in her audience? You know? And it could not even, it doesn't have to be Erica Badu. It could be like um, some billionaire, right? Like some, some, some lecturer or, or just a professor, how do you determine who's going to be in their audience? And so for the most part, you could say, well, whoever's willing to sacrifice, whoever's willing to pay for it, right? And 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 how what, what does the sacrifice look like? What does the pay look like? Well, that is, you know, you have your earnings and and you you would actually risk something to it, you know? And and so like like I mean it's it's complicated, but I think that that's a question that we want to engage and I think I'm going to try to engage it. I think the I think I'm going to try to engage it um, just for whatever. But it, it's really a question of how do you determine distribution outside of cash? You know, especially if you're trading with the world and the world is giving you cash. You know, uh, if this kind of capitalist, and not just cash, I mean, like, it's just giving you stuff. And how do you distribute that afterward? How do you distribute earnings? Um if this kind of capitalist development takes place widely over the country, we may get a good statistical increase in the national wealth of Tanzania, but the masses of the people will not necessarily be better off. On the contrary, as land becomes more scarce, we shall find ourselves with a farmer's class and a laborer's class, with the latter being unable either to work for themselves or to receive a full return for the contribution they are making to the total output. They will become a rural proletariat, depending on the decisions of other men for their existence, and subject in consequence to all the subservience 
social and economic inequality and insecurity which such a position involves. Certainly at the moment, everyone has a choice between working for others or farming on his own. In Tanzania's circumstance, it may therefore seem unnecessary to be worrying about the implications of agricultural capitalist development, implications which do will not reveal themselves in their full force until a shortage of land becomes a problem for our nation. Exactly. Not even a shortage of land. But there are already local shortages of land in popular, fertile, and well-watered areas. And in any case, if we allow this pattern of agriculture, and that's a good point, you know, like the, the fertile and well-watered areas are already, you know, purchased off. And in any case, if we allow this pattern of agriculture to grow, we shall continue to move further and further away from our goal of human equality. Uh, Small-scale capitalist agriculture we now have is not really a danger, but our feet are on the wrong path. And if we continue to encourage or even help the development of agricultural capitalism, we shall never become a socialist state. On the contrary, we shall be continuing to break up of the traditional concept of human equality based on sharing all the necessaries, necessities of life and on a universal obligation to work. Right. So there is, however, another institution. And again, like like that's an issue. Like you're you're holding on to these concepts that it might not necessarily be um, like it's, it might not necessarily like it's not necessarily true um, per se. And, and or it might just be really relatively local, you know, um, like it might just be relatively local and situational. And you're kind of like expanding it to like, when the situation done changed. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's that's the issue. Because, again, like I said, like, you know, there was this one presentation. I really like, enjoyed it. But it's this. uh um, you know, the, the one I did about African culture is not real type thing. And I was like, um, if you look at the how the how the hunter gatherers live and you look at how the um, the uh, herders live, right, the nomadic herders live, it's very different from how we describe the the uh, the agriculturalists. And then what you kind of pick up on. And then how the industrialists live is also different. So you kind of pick up on how the change in the economy is the change in the culture. And but but trying to force the same economy on a different culture, like we already have that problem. That's what the uh, the Bible is about. You know, it's like here you have this modern industry, and and then you're like forcing the her the nomadic herder life. You know, the nomadic herder belief system on the um, on the uh, on the on the industrialists. You know. So, like, you know, you're forcing this women's inequality, like this women inferiority in a society where women can, you know, do most everything, you know, uh, like, like like most of the jobs. Not Obviously not the logging and, you know, all that stuff. Or they could, but it's like they wouldn't want to or something. But, like, most of the stuff. Um, like, they could do, the, they could be computer engineers and IT developers. You know, like, like there's real opportunity for women but then we're just like no women should be in the home or something and it's not to say that women should be out of the home per se or women shouldn't be you know it's not it's not to say that it's just to say that yes a woman is definitely capable of 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 computing stuff and so obviously you know you could you know like like you would ha you'd want to accommodate for that in a sense you know what i mean like what if like like how can that be um like how can that change? For instance, um, like how, like 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 you want to build your economy or your social system around the reality that you know you there's productive there's productivity available to women. Um, essentially, what I'm saying is this: you don't want to just use some Middle Eastern um, value system in a in a in a in a modern economy, you know. Uh, like you don't want it. Like this doesn't make any sense. But it's the same. Like you don't actually want to use um, this 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 village value system in a modern economy per se, you know, uh, or an industrial internationalist economy. Uh, there is, however, another institution in rural life which has brought a very great change to many of our peasants, which in which does stem from the socialist principles of avoiding the exploitation of man by man. A large part of our farms produced is now marketed by cooperative societies which are owned and governed by the farmers themselves, working together for their own benefit. Many criticisms have been made for the workings of our own of our cooperative societies. Now he made these, right? I think they're like Ujama villages. There's like a video where you can watch it. It's pretty interesting. Uh 
Much practical improvement is necessary for if they are really to serve the farmers and not to replace the exploitation of man by man by the exploitation of inefficiency and bureaucratic dishonesty. Mm-hmm. There is no doubt that marketing by farmers without the intervention of middlemen who are endeavoring to pay as little as possible to the farmers and receive as much as possible from the consumer can be to the benefit of both the farmers and the rest of the community. In criticizing the working or of existing cooperative societies, we must not make the mistake of blaming... <sighs> The principles of cooperation. The problems of cooperation, cooperatives are practical ones, which may be worked and are dealt with but by better and more skilled management and commercial machinery. But although marketing cooperatives are socialist in the sense that they represent the joint activities of producers, they could be socialist institutions serving capitalism if the basic organization of agricultural production is capitalist. Uh, Okay. It is not inconsistent with the capitalist philosophy of the United States of America that farmers' cooperatives exist there and are quite strong. For a farmers' cooperative, marketing society is an institution serving the farmer. If they are capitalist farmers, then the existence of a cooperative marketing economy will mean that one group of of capitalists, the farmers, are safeguarding their own interests as against another group of capitalists, the middlemen. It is only if the agricultural production itself is organized on a socialist pattern that cooperative marketing uh, societies are serving socialism. So he's actually giving you guys the whole thing where we're like, hey, we don't want to be capitalists. Let's try for cooperative economics. And he's just like, hey, you know what? The cooperative economics could be capitalist too. You know, uh, and he's like, now, now it could be socialist, but you'd have to, um, you'd have to be serving socialism. Now the thing is, I feel like he's way too hooked on this idea of socialism, like this whole this whole idea of this dichotomy between socialism and capitalism. And, and my thinking is that, you know, as I'm reading more of you know Wazungu's you know theories on quote unquote capitalism, I realized that it his theories were not necessarily on capitalism. You know what I mean? Uh, we just kind of in retrospect, use the Marxian um, dictums to to make it that way. And it's just like, it's kind of reminiscent of the idea that, you know, Garvey was not considered a Pan-Africanist in his lifetime. But like in retrospect, we look at him as, you know, like a found, like, you know, a, a leader in Pan-African thought. But he would have been, uh, well, he would call himself an African fundamentalist or even, I would say, uh, a nationalist, African nationalist. Uh, uh, he, yeah, and so that's like the the difference, you know that that sometimes we as modern people we kind of look back and we you know we harp over these, these these ideas of other people and we just kind of like ignore the reality of of the situation. That is, you know, the cooperative economics is actually pretty good, but the uh, the socialism is just imagination. You know, it's just imaginary. But anyway, summarizing the present position. Uh, actually, let me look at the comments. Uh, no, there's no more comments. Uh, summarizing the present position. At this point, let us try to sum up the present position in Tanzania in a few words. We have the vast majority of our people living in the rural areas, most of them working on their own as farmers who do not employ any labor, but produce their own food and some additional crops which they sell. Many of them try to adopt modern methods, each of his own particular farm and while working in isolation, just like every worker trying to have his own factory. There are, in addition, a small number of agricultural employers. A few of these are estates employing some hundreds of workers, but increasingly, although still in small numbers, the employers are individuals employing a few people for perhaps only part of the year. Here and there over the country, we do have groups of people working on terms of equality and sharing the proceeds in cooperative farms, but these groups are so small in number that they do not yet make a real impact either on our total agricultural output or, except locally, on the social structures which is developing. They are important only as examples of what could be, not as indications of what is. Thus, we still have in this country a predominantly peasant society in which farmers work for themselves and their families and are helped and protected from exploitation by cooperative marketing arrangements. Yet the present trend is away from the extended family production and social unity and towards the development of a class system in the rural areas. It is a kind of development which would be inconsistent with the growth of a socialist Tanzania in which all citizens could be assured of human dignity and equality and in which all were able to have a decent and constantly improving life for themselves and their children. Uh, Tanzania as it must develop. 
For the future, for the foreseeable future, the vast majority of our people will continue to spend their lives in the rural areas and continue to work on the land. The land is the only basis of Tanzania's development. We have no other. Therefore, if our rural life is not based on the principles of socialism, our country will not be socialist. Regardless of how we organize our industrial sector and regardless of our commercial and political arrangements, Tanzanian socialism must be firmly based on the land and its workers. This means that we have to build up the countryside in such a way that our people have a better standard of living while living together in terms of equality and fraternity. It also means that the course of time, the advantages of town life in the way of services and personal pleasures and opportunities must become available to those who work in the rural sector as much as those in the urban areas. Yeah. Um, so again, like it's going to be a little harder. You want to centralize things. If we are to succeed in this, certain things are essential. The first of this, these is hard work by our people. There is no substitute for it, especially as we do have a large accumulation of capital, which can be invested in agricultural, labor-saving devices, or in increasing productivity. We have to increase the amount we produce from our land, and we shall have to do it by the use of our own hands and our own brains. No organization or society can do away with this. Whether we are capitalist, socialist, communist, fascist, or anything else, only an increase in output can provide an extra goods needed for our people to have the opportunity for a good life. The type of social organization we adopt affects both the distribution of the goods we produce and the quality of the life our people can lead. But it is relevant to the central fact that our output of goods has to be increased. Each person has to produce more by harder, longer, and better work. Now, this is a, this is a, like, he's such a good man. Son, come here, sit down. All right, I'm going to tell my son to sit down next to me. It is not enough, however, for agricultural production to be increased. No, 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 no. Whoa, hold on a second. Don't. All right. It is not enough, however, for agricultural production to be increased. Marketing must be properly organized so that even while our nation is in the grips of international market forces which control world prices, still we get the maximum possible for our goods and our producers, that is, our farmers, get a fair return for their contribution to the national wealth. The cooperative movement in particular must be made more efficient, both in management and its democratic machinery. Not only this, there must also be an efficient and democratic system of local government so that our people make their own decisions on the things which affect them directly and so that they are able to recognize their own control over community decisions and their own responsibility for carrying them out. And this local control has to be organized in such a manner that the nation is united and working together for common needs and for the maximum development of our whole society. Now, again, I do I do also like local government as well. Uh, and finally, the, I'm like, you know, who cares? But... Uh, and finally, the whole rural society must be built on the basis of the equality of all Tanzanian citizens and their common obligation and common rights. There must be no masters and servants, but just people working together for the good of all and thus their own goods. We shall be unable to fulfill... We shall be unable to fulfill these objectives if we continue to produce as individuals for individual profit. Certainly a man who is working for himself and for his own profit will not suffer from exploitation in this employment, but neither will he make much progress. This is saying, look at this. Certainly a man who is working for himself and for his own profit will not suffer from exploitation in his employment, but neither will he make much progress. It is not long before an individual working alone reaches the limits of his powers. Only by working together can men overcome their limitation. The truth is that when human beings want to make great progress, they have no alternative but to combine their efforts. And there are only two methods by which this can be done. People can be made to work together or they can work together. We can be made to work together by or and for the benefit of a slave owner or by and for the profit of a capitalist. Alternatively, we can work together voluntarily for our own benefit. We shall achieve the goals we in this country have set ourselves if the basis of Tanzania life consists of rural economic and social communities where people live together and work together for the good of all and which are interlocked so that all of the different communities also work together in cooperation for the common good of the nation as a whole. So what he's saying is, um, what is he saying? We can achieve the goals in this country. Um, yeah, so again, like, you know, you don't want to look at somebody working for another person as capitalists. You don't want to look at it as slave wait, labor. Like, you, you could just look at it as a normal economic thing. And, and when you do that, when you, like, you could advance the economy. Because, like, give it another example. Um, let's say I'm good at math. And I'm, like, let's say I'm a good math tutor, right? 
paying me to tutor your kid is not you exploiting me. It's not you enslaving me. It's just you telling me, hey, look, your job now is to teach children. You get what I'm saying? No, you're not going to provide for my living wages when I'm not teaching children. You're going to say, look, if you want to make a living from teaching children, you have to teach children. You have to charge a certain amount of money. You have to do it and so forth. That's what you need to do. And it's not me exploiting. It's not me being exploited. Yes, I'm working for you, but and I'm not working for food. I'm not working the land. Uh, and that's that's a that's a thing that you know if you don't have that in a society, then you're just not going to have people who are going to be professionally engaged in the uh, teaching of children. The principle upon or teaching of children privately. You know, uh, let's see, the comments, Trigger Happy says, what would you call Adam Smith then? Like, what would be the name of his ideology or vision of economic system? So Adam Smith was, like, that's what I'm saying. So with regard to Adam Smith, it seemed like he was just describing the economics as he saw it and as he saw it to, um, as he saw it to be improved, you know? Um, he, he didn't, like, articulate capitalism, capital, blah, blah, blah. He was just like, this is what it is. You know what I mean? It was It was more of, like... What I'm picking up from it is that it was more of a history book with with uh, recommendations added to it, you know, like history and science, but recommendations added to it. So he would say, this is what they do in England. This is what they do in France. And the English system was more profitable. You know what I mean? Or this is what they do in, in Spain. This is what they do in England. This is what they did in France. And this is what they do with the Dutch. And the Dutch system is more profitable. Or this is how the Chinese did it. This is how the Egyptians did it. This is how the Indians did it. And those are the three richest nations in the history of mankind. So it's not that he was um, like like sometimes he would argue for if you do not have bounties, if you do not. Well, he called them bounties. I don't know what a bounty is. But he was like, if you do not have um, trade, what do you say? Um, like basically trade restrictions, like if the community is not of tariffs and stuff like that. If you don't have that kind of stuff, then the, the product of the goods is cheaper for everybody and, and, and the people who blah, blah, blah. And basically, that's why I have the invisible hand kind of thing. So it's like it's not so much that he was like, hey, let me articulate on capitalism as much as it was like, hey, this is what this is what this country is doing. This is what that country is doing. This is what this country. And because this is what they were all doing, um, that's what I want to um, like, like, like I would recommend this as a policy for 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 us. You know, if we want to get more wealth, then we'll probably wouldn't do this thing that we did before. And that caused the wealth to go down. You know what I mean? Uh, so so that's what it is. Uh, Learning Curve says, unless your people are the only humans, equality for all humans is a fantasy. You can never know the thoughts of another person, not even your own family members. Yeah, more or less. And and that's the thing, too. It's like even if you did know the thoughts of your family, right? Like if you did educate them, you're not educating the whole planet. You know? So it doesn't really like 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 if you want to get the biggest advantage to yourself, you have to like operate in that kind of way. Um, learning curses, it only becomes wage slavery because you have to pay rent, taxes, and many other costs. We live in a rented life and cannot afford to do work that will best support growth. Yeah, there's this woman, her name is Carolina Maria de Jesus, I guess. I don't know. Mar Carolina Maria de, de Jesus, whatever her name is, right? Um, I don't know if it's Jesus or Jesus. She's from like a Latin American country. And she had one of the more important quotes I came across. I think I put it in the Pro Black Compendium. But she goes, um, wait, what did she say? Um, the, I think it was like, damn, you see my memory? My memory is like going. Oh, gosh. All right. Let me, let me just find the quote real quickly. Because <laughs> that's like low key embarrassing. But it's like, um, something about the cost. Let me see. Cause it's, it's so well put. Oh, she says, actually we are slaves to the cost of living. There you go. It's so well put that I'm just like, let me, let me write it down. Like, let me, let me have it. But she's like, when you talk about slavery, you're really talking about the cost of living. You know what I mean? Uh, and so, uh, you know, you know, she, she, she's, she's the sister from another mister, right? But basically, she's a uh, uh, learning curve is, 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 is saying what she said, which is, you know, 
It becomes wage because you are paying rented rent taxes and many other costs. We have a rented life and cannot afford to do work where we best support growth. And so it's like the same thing. It's like we are slaves to the cost of living. The, the way how slavery comes about is the cost of living. And that's actually, I'll tell you guys this. That was an interesting story where this guy, um, this, this brother was using the N-word next to me. And I was like, hey, man, could you not call the N-word? Uh, because it's a word associated with slavery. And let's be honest. I said, look, look. If I were to pay you a thousand dollars a day, right, to live on my village, like to like live in my island, right, um, how would like would that be a good? He's like, yeah, it sounds good. You know, thousand dollars a day, that's not bad, right? And so I said, now what if the cost of bread was five thousand dollars on that island? Is it still good to pay you a thousand dollars a day? And he goes, well, no. You know what I mean? Because all you could do is afford a loaf of bread after a week. You know, and I said, yeah, if somebody else is co controlling your cost of living, then they've enslaved you pretty much. And I said, look, um, these other people are control all the costs around you. So why would you use this term associated with slavery? You get what I'm saying? And then he says, oh, I apologize, sir. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I didn't tell you to call me, sir. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I just said stop calling me Edward. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's uh, like like that's uh, the way how Learning Curve is said it. The way how Carolina Carolina Maria de Jesus said it. Um, like yeah, that's that's it. Like realistically. But 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 I I say that to say that you know if I were a math tutor, that's what I was saying. If I was a math tutor, it wouldn't necessarily be slavery. Now, obviously, if I can't do anything but math tutor and like I had to suffer while I did it, that's a different story. You know, if the cost of living was absurd, but if I can support myself from teaching math, that's a good thing. Um, if I can't support myself, notwithstanding teaching math, um, uh, and that's like a necessary good, I guess, you know, that's another thing. So, like, realistically, this is, you know, this is a concern for us as a people. And, of course, I'm just going to, you know, repeat, you know, appreciation to Learning Curve for um, doing, for, you know, sharing her wisdom with us today. Um um, and of course, Trigger Happy. Trigger Happy is here as well. Appreciation to that brother, too. Um, all right. The principles upon which the traditional extended family was based must be reactivated. We can start with extended family villages, but they will not remain family communities, and they must certainly be larger communities than was traditionally the case. Also, modern knowledge must be applied by these communities and to them, and the barriers which previously existed between different groups must be broken down so that they can cooperate in the achievement of major tasks. But the basis of rural life in Tanzania must be the practice of cooperation in its widest sense in living and working and in distribution and all with an acceptance of the absolute equality of all men and women. And I want to say this, like if you were 1967 and you had the good chance to go to America and, and, and study agricultural sciences. Hold on a second. Uh, the good thing is that if you were to, um, you know, if you were to, I mean, sorry, not the good thing. This boy is making all this noise. Um, all right. So uh, if you were to, yeah, if you were to go to America, you would be propagandized in America against the village way. You will say, hey, you know what? The way how the Americans are doing it is pretty efficient. It's pretty effective. I don't need to freaking know my neighbor. I don't need to work with my neighbor. I don't need to even like my neighbor. Like literally my neighbor has no control over my freaking life. You know what I mean? I don't know my mayor. I don't have to deal with community politics. I don't have to deal with local politics unless I want to. You know, like it's, it's like, and yet the system is running and the system is efficient and the system is so on and so forth. And, and what happens is that that's one of the issues that we also run into is this reality that if we like like what the, one of the solutions that would be all right, you know, is to say that you say, hey, instead of like 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 what if we were to send our kids over to the West to whatever. And you know, we all have we all remember the Qaddafi quote where he's like Qaddafi's like, don't go to America and get yourself a white woman. You know what I mean? Go and learn some stuff and bring it back to Libya. But the reality is this, that you go and learn some stuff, and some of the stuff you're going to learn is, well, F the traditional way of life. It's outdated. It's antiquated. You know what I mean? And it's like, how could you not learn that? It's like every, every one of us in the Western world, well, like 99% like of us, 
and like and if you're including the conscious community maybe you'll say 90 percent of us recognizes that the traditional life is antiquated and outdated like very few of us are trying to go into a traditional village without electricity you know what i mean without internet and 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 yet, you know, when you talk, when you start talking about electricity and internet, you start talking about production models that do not relate to any of this thing that um, Nyerere is talking about. Because producing electricity is not a cooperative family affair. You know, uh, the internet, you know, maintenance of the internet is not a traditional family affair. You know, like like satellites in space is 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 a is a is a very learned. Uh, occupation it's it's you know this is this is this is this is what is is meant by you know this is what i mean like you know we're we have a tough 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 situation to deal with um and that it is what it is so this is very different from our present organization of society and requires a reversal of the present trend we shall not achieve it quickly it is uh different because it involves a determination to maintain human equality it is different because it is dominant characteristic would be uh, cooperation, not competition, and its criteria for individual success would be good service, not the accumulation of private property. This question is, how can we organize our activities now so as to eventually to reach this goal? So he's like, there's no simple or single answer for all circumstances. It's essential to realize that within this unity of Tanzania, there is also such diversity that it would be foolish for someone in Dar es Salaam. And, and I'll just say this too, he writes really well. Like every one of his new ideas has uh, 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 like, a, like, a, like a theme sentence, you know, that's really good. Now, I can't a subtitle. Now, I don't know if it's the editor um, of his work that is doing this for his work, but a part of me is convinced that it's him. And for that, I'm like, damn, this guy is really well organized, really well put together, like it's so good. Like I, I'm mad at the white folk for pushing this socialism idea on him, you know, or this religious idea on him, or these Western ideas on him. But fundamentally, this is just a really impressive individual, you know. Um, part of me, like right now, like I might, like I'm thinking about. I should probably make a note to like subtitle my work, like the way how he subtitles his work, because it's just nice, clear writing hold on i just i probably uh, let me make a note i'm sorry fam let me make a note i have this uh document that i'm like working on with a bunch of my ideas on what i want to write and all that kind of stuff and i mean it's constantly growing as i keep writing and learning more i keep reading and and, and learning more but i'm going to just make a note to like be like use a lot of like i'm just gonna write it hold on a second use a lot of subtitles like the ad is Ujama. like gotta give this brother credit like he's that's impressive i mean i don't know maybe there were other books like this but i don't i don't really recall it being this well what do you guys think um what do you guys think about niade's writing style um you guys can put that in the chat so it says no simple or single answer for all circumstances so it is essential to realize that within the unity of tanzania there is also such diversity that it would be foolish for someone in Dar es Salaam to try to draw up a blueprint for the crop production and social organization which has to be applied to every corner of our large country. Principles of action can be set out, but the application of these principles must take into account the different geographical and geological conditions in different areas and also the local variations in the basically similar traditional structures. This is also why I say that it doesn't make sense to be a pan-Africanist while you're in the Western world, you know? Your solutions are going to be different for the geographical and geological conditions in different areas and so on and so forth, and the local variations and the, of the basically similar traditional structures. You know, the point being that you, you should, you got to go scout, you got to go to whatever country in Africa you want to be, then you got to go into whatever region, locality you want to be in, and then you could do your work. You can't just say, hey, you know what, Africa needs to do it and so forth. You got to be in Africa to figure out what they need in that particular area where you would exist in you know and so he goes on he says for example in the kilimanjaro region not only is the practice of individual land holding almost universal but there also there is no unused land on the mountain 
So the Kilimanjaro is a mountain. This affects social attitudes and creates some family problems which do not exist in those parts of Tanzania where a young man can get land of his own quite near to his father's farm as soon as he's ready to start his own family. Again, some parts of our country suffer from great water shortages or uncertainty. Their agricultural organization, their density of population, and thus their social organization must inevitably take into account of these facts just as the organization is well watered and well watered areas must take advantage of its greater potential. So there's, there's going to be water shortages. How do you determine who gets the water? All these things affect what can be grown and the degree of investment in land or implements which is necessary for a given output. It would be absurd to try and settle all these questions from Dar es Salaam, particularly as such variations as those of the type of soil sometimes occur within a very small area. Local initiatives and self-reliance are essential. The social customs of the people... Let me see if I have my screen up. Okay. The social customs... Let me just double check. The social customs of the people are also vary to some extent. The Maasai are traditionally a nomadic cattle people. See what I'm saying? The family structure, the religious beliefs, and other things have been shaped by this fact. They are therefore somewhat different from the social beliefs and organization of, for example, the Shalia agricultural Wanyakusa. Right? So, again, you have the Maasai and you have the Wanyakusa. I, I gotta, I gotta like practice saying that because, you know, I was making fun of uh, Tanzan. Tanzan's gonna be like, oh, I know, I know everything. Uh, <laughs> she can't say bungee jumping though, but anyway. <laughs> the steps which will be necessary to combine increased output with social equality may therefore also vary. The important thing is that the methods adopted should not be incompatible with each other and should each be appropriate for the attainment of the single goal in the particular circumstance. So again, you see the agricultural is different from the nomadic, you know? Uh, uh, combine increase with the social equality may therefore also vary. But 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 now he's kind of forcing all of these the the the, the nomadic and the agricultural uh, to be agricultural, notwithstanding the fact that he wants to move the the society to a, a later economic order of the industrial, you know, uh, or not a later a different economic order, you know, it's not necessarily, um, um, yeah, you guys get it. So anyway, it's quite apart from these. Local considerations, however, there is another factor which would prevent one universally applied method being introduced, for there are some things of which the nation as a whole has great need, but which might not be in the particular interest of any one locality or any particular group of farmers. Thus, for example, it may be necessary for purposes of water control to have forests at the headland of rivers and to prevent cultivation or animal herding there. The farmer in these regions might easily feel that this is not in their interest, that they would be economically better off by farming such land rather than leaving it for trees from which no return can be expected for perhaps 50 years. Or to take another example, tourism brings important foreign exchange into the country, but any individual farmer would prefer to kill off wild beasts which might eat his produce rather than protect them for other people to look at. Or again, some crops demand heavy mechanization or other investments if they are to be most economically produced. No single farmer could undertake such work on his own, even a cooperative group would have difficulties at the beginning because of heavy initial capital requirements and the consequent big burden of debt they would be accepting. So, you, now this is really, like, oh my gosh. Like, he's giving you, he's, he's shooting game, okay? He's shooting game, all right? So, I think a lot of us would read this and not fully appreciate it. This is a real leader, who's dealing with real situations and he's unfortunately too ideological but he's still observing what's going on right so he's like quite apart from local considerations there's bigger things right however there's also another factor which would prevent one universally applied method being introduced and the reality is this that the that how varied the economy is so he's like look who's to decide whether there should be trees in front of the rivers, right? He's like, thus, for example, it may be necessary for a purpose of water control to have forests at the headlands of rivers. Who's to, or to, and, and, and to prevent animal cultivation of animal herding there, right? So he's like, forests have a purpose. Who's to decide whether the forest should be there or not? You know? Um, on the other hand, he's like, wild animals have a problem. Like, wild animals are a problem. But who's to decide whether wild animals should be maintained or are or, or killed? 
you know and that's one of the issues with the um the quote-unquote purely capitalist model right is this idea that realistically individuals will take up this based off of what is profitable right but he's pointing out well you know what might be profitable what might actually sabotage water control right or what might be profitable might be profitable for the the tourism industry but not necessarily profitable for the farmer or might be profitable for the farmer not necessarily the tourism industry and this is where i would say government comes into place you know um this is where government comes into place but all right let's keep going for this kind of overriding national need, it is essential that there should be positive government action in the field of agriculture as in other aspects of the economy. There must be state forests and local authority forests of different kinds. There must be national parks controlled and run by the public, acting through government or the local authority. There must be other areas in which shooting of game is prohibited or controlled. In addition, there should be state farms or local authority farms which deal especially with those crops which can be grown most economically for export or for urban sale only on a mechanized or large-scale basis or where a combination of research and development is required, as, for example, in the state cattle ranching farm at Kangwa. In such cases, as these traditional agricultural methods can have no place, they are not, they are not appropriate. The choice is really only between allowing a few wealthy individuals to undertake the profitable work if they wish or reserving all of it for a state operation. See what I'm saying? In such cases as the traditional agricultural methods can have no place, so there are places, he's like, they are not appropriate. Um, the choices, there's only two choices. Do you make wealthy individuals or do you have the state do everything? And that's the question, you know? That's the question. Uh, EL is waving. Peace to EL. Um, EL, EL, EL not, hasn't been in the sun recently. I think this hand, the, the hand color, might be a little lighter than uh, he always he usually does. Although I really can't tell. I'm just I'm just messing around. <laughs> like if you, if you change the complexion with the hands, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm just messing. I, I don't remember. Um I don't remember that kind of detail. <laughs> All right. So in Tanzania, it is clear that as a general rule, new development of this kind should be operated by the public, although some private or joint private and public investment may be appropriate in certain cases where expertise or capital is an immediate problem. But certainly it is better that the workers in plantation agriculture should be employed by the community as a whole. <sighs> the community should have dominant voice in their wages and conditions. By such public or joint public and private employment, the workers on this kind of mass production farm can be sure of fair treatment and can do their work knowing that any proceeds from the farm go to the community in general or are being used for further investment. Here, come here. Come here. Sit down. Uh, further investment. The workers will be able to know that their efforts are not just benefiting company shareholders whom they do not know and who do nothing to make the enterprise a success. Thus, included in the rural and agricultural organization of a socialist Tanzania, there must be some state or other public enterprises operated under the control of appointed managers and employing labor just as the nationalized food mills do. But this should only be a small part of the agricultural sector in Tanzania. It should not be our purpose to convert our peasants into wage earners, even on government farms. So that, again, he's like, I don't know what to say. Let me see something. So there includes I, I, my, bro my, 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 my brother, my son, uh, <laughs> distracted me. Uh, he says, this included in the rural and agricultural organization of social Tanzania, there sh must be some state or other public enterprises. So you want the state enterprises. And like, I'm not necessarily a, a, opposed to state enterprises. I don't think anybody really is um, like just universally opposed to state enterprises. Because again, like, no, but I don't think so. Right. But anyway, operated under the control of appointment managers and employing labor, just as the nationalized food mills do. But this should only be a small part of the agricultural sector in Tanzania. Now, why are you putting that restriction on that? That's the question. It should not be our purpose to convert our peasants into wage earners, even on government farms. So again, like, why not? To make our socialism and our democracy a reality, we should instead adapt a modern needs, the traditional structure of African society. Now, again, he's talking about the traditional rural structure that doesn't even apply to wages. Uh, and again, it's like not the traditional African society. I wouldn't like that's the thing I would want to avoid. So he says we must, in other words, aim at creating a nation in which Ujamaa farms and communities dominate the rural economy and set the social pattern for the country as a whole. So what is Ujamaa agriculture? Um, again, I really appreciate his writing style. You guys let me know. Um, El is laughing. You know, I made a little joke. Um, uh, sorry. So Ujamaa agriculture in a socialist Tanzania, then 
Our agricultural organization would be predominantly that of cooperative living and working for the good of all. This means that most of our farming would be done by groups of people who live as a community and work as a community. They would live together in a village, they would farm together, market together, and undertake the provision of local services and small local requirements as a community. Their community would be the traditional family group or any other group of people living according to Ujamaa principles, large enough to take apart account of modern methods and the 20th century needs of man. The land this community farmed would be called our land by all the members. The crops they produced on the land would be our crops. It would be our shop which provided individual members uh, with the day-to-day -day necessities from outside. Our workshop which made the uh, bricks from which houses and other buildings were constructed and so on. Now, I want to say this. We have to appreciate him. We have to appreciate him for trying this. I don't believe in it. You know, I don't think it's good in a theoretical way. But you know what? He tried it. He tried it, you know? And that's admirable in and of itself. You know, the fact that he tried to do something. Because what it also does for us is it tells us what not to try. You know? It tells us what not to try. It's like, it's like, it's like you know, like, for instance, when it comes to let's say the dating world, right? Because everybody relates to the dating world, right? When it comes to the dating world, there's like guys who are, you know, let's say, uh, I don't want to use the word simp because we use the word simp all the time, <laughs> right? But there are guys who, come, no, you can't, you can't. All right. So there are guys who, um, uh, like, let's say they're like absolutely fawning over a woman or something like that, right? Um, and, and, and like, uh, like if, if there's some guy writes out, you know, the way to a woman's heart is to, you know, absolutely fawn over her and adore her and like low key cyber stalk her and stalk her and blah, 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 blah. Right. It's obviously bad. It's a bad idea. <laughs> but if you like really believe that and you really go out and try that and then you admit to your mistakes and you just cool it. I mean, obviously, I'm not encouraging a dude to cyber stalk or any of that shit. But what I'm saying is that if you believe in that stuff and then you did it. And then you documented your observations and was like, yeah, this is not the way, guys. You know, apologies to the ladies and all that kind of stuff, right? Then, like, props to you, you know, for for, give, for doing it so that none of us, none of the rest of us has to do it. You know what I mean? Because what happens is this. If we didn't come across Nyerere's attempt at socialism, like, Nyerere didn't come across an earlier African's attempt at socialism. That's what I'm trying to say. Or, or if he did, it was like, you know, Cuba and maybe like Grenada, but there was so many sabotage. He tries it and he really documents and 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 it's like, yeah, OK, we get you, bro. You know, like like good on you. Um, so that's what I want to say about that. Um, although it looks like everybody left. I got like one one listener now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody wants to know about the cyber stalkers. Uh, all right. So obviously such community activities would need to be organized, would need to have a manager responsible for the allocation of tasks. Hold on a second. Obviously such community activities would need to be organized, would need to have a manager responsible for the allocation of tasks and their supervision. There would need to be a treasurer responsible for the money earned and its administration, Sorry, obviously such community activities would need to be organized. It would need to have a manager responsible for the allocation of tasks and their supervision. There would need to be a treasurer responsible for the money earned in its administration and a governing committee which is able to take executive decisions in between general meetings. But all these people could come from among the community and must do so if it is to be the real social unit. They would be members of the community, not outsiders. Although at the beginning there may be an advantage in attaching to such schemes, some technical and other advisors if the right kind of experts could be found. Such groups are possible in Tanzania. Indeed, a few already exist. There is no need to wait for the government to organize them and give all the instructions, nor would it be sensible to expect everyone who joins such a group to be willing to think only of the community interests and never of his own. Such unselfishness is rare in man, and no social organization uh, uh, should be based on the expectation that all members will be angels. You want to highlight that. No social organization should be based on the expectation that all members will be angels. Okay? When he says what is required, and that's like, you know, Christian nonsense, but still. Um, what he's basically saying is like, 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 don't expect your people not to smoke. Don't expect your people not to drink. Don't expect your people not to F up. Don't expect your people to be sex addicts. Don't expect that. Um, like, expect that maybe some people will be different. Um, and that's okay. Uh, but he doesn't, I don't think he really applies that per se. 
but um and it's a good thing that he he said it like he's wise you know but i think he's wrestling or he was wrestling with this socialism idea uh what is required is a sensible organization okay what is required is a sensible organization which can be shown to be the be to the benefit of all people members this can be done if every member has certain responsibilities to the community and is able to see his benefits from it because they are benefits to himself and to his own village. The essential thing is that the community would be farming as a group and living as a group. Investment in the community would be investment in the farm of every member. Investment in the village, such as uh, a clean water supply, would be a benefit to every member. The return from the produce of the farm and from all other activities of the community would be shared according to the work done and the need of the members with the small amount uh, being paid in taxes and another amount which is determined by the members themselves invested in their own future. There would be no need to exclude private property in houses or even in cattle. Some energetic members may wish to have their own garden as well as share in the community farm. The extent of the private activities may well vary from one village to another, but always on the basis that no member is allowed to exploit another, nor to exploit a non-member. That will that all must play a fair part in the life of the community from which they all benefit. So, you know, again, he's like really opposed to making other people work for you, which again, it 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 has its limitations. Like I it's like you you don't want to hold on to this idea. You wanna like it's like like I said, like it when it comes to okay, well now we have a math tutor. Right? Should the math tutor also, like, should the math tutor not be paid? You get what I'm saying? And that's where it like really begins to differentiate. Um, like, if you if you if you just have a rural economy, sure, it's it, it's it's okay if there's because again, you're not gonna need math tutors because nobody's doing advanced mathematics. You know, a math tutor is gonna leave, like nobody's doing sine and cosine. And, um, you know, geometry problems uh, like they, they might do some things that are mathematically oriented, but it's not it's not that big a deal. You can just pull out a ruler. You know what I mean? Uh, like, 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 for instance, my. Uh, my. Uh, oh, shoot, I totally forgot I had to do something, but my uh, plumber, what have you, he's like, um, like, 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 it's like, what's the measurement that I like? What's the. How how big of a pipe does he need to fix this um this 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 pipe that I have right and he like tries to measure it but he's at a bad angle and so somebody like me could be like yo you know you're not applying the angle and so you're not applying the cosine but it's really not that important he just get he's like I'll just get twice the length and cut it in half if if need be and that's it you know uh so so I mean that's just another thing. So hey, such living and working in communities could transform our lives in Tanzania. Uh, we would not... Now, hopefully that's not him, right? <laughs> uh, no, it's not. <laughs> He's just like, wait a second. I, I actually remember that I had like some sort of uh, plumbing need. All right. Such living and working in communities could transform our lives in Tanzania. We would not automatically become wealthy, although we, would all, we could all become a little richer than we are now. But most important of all, any increase in the amount of wealth we produce under this system would be ours. It would not belong just to one or two individuals, but to all those who work had produced it. Uh, all but to all those, sorry. Most important of all, any increase in the amount of wealth we produce under this system would be ours. It would not belong just to one or two individuals, but to all those who work, whose work had produced it. At the same time, we should take, we should have strengthened our traditional equality and our traditional security. Um, for in the village community, a man who is genuinely sick during the harvest would not be left to starve for the rest of the year, nor would the man whose wife is ill find the children uncared for, as he might do if he's farms on his own. Traditional African socialism always made such questions as these irrelevant, and our modern socialism, by resting on the same foundation, will also make them irrelevant. For in each Ujamaa village, the man who is sick will be cared for, a man who is widowed will have no difficulty in getting his children looked after. The old, the unmarried, the orphans, and other people in this kind of trouble will be looked after by the village as a whole, just as was done in traditional society. Um, so, for those of you who are curious, I did write a book called Zubiri, 
and it is like a fictional account of like an urban life so make sure you guys check it out like Zubiri I think he doesn't have a wife and so his child Amadi um, is uh, always in a like, like, like essentially like he, 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 he can go to daycare you know what I mean uh, like a community available daycare um, but anyway, so group work of this kind too would almost certainly allow for greater production, production and greater services in the community with the consequent benefit to all members. It would be possible to acquire some modern tools if the members are willing to invest in them. Some degree of specialization would be possible with one member being, for example, a carpenter who makes the tables, chairs, doors, and other things needed by the community. And see, that's what I'm saying. This specialization did happen in Africa and work on the lands only during times of, great pre of greatest pressure, like the harvest. So you'll see that this carpenter is now working less. The tutor is working less. And then at some point when your society is so massive, the, the carpenter and, the, and the, the tutor do not work at all. You know, Another member could be responsible for building work, um, another for running a nursery where children could be cared for, I was talking about that, and fed, while most of the mothers are in the fields and so on. By such division of labor arranged by the members according to their own needs, the villagers could make their whole life more fruitful and pleasant. So you'll see that um, this, is, this, is, this is basically kind of like what I was saying about regard to like what Adam Smith was observing kind of thing, where it's like you then get this division of labor. And then when you have this division of labor, like there's another stage to it where um, like for instance, this carpenter may want to sell his tables and chairs and doors to other villagers you know or to a larger market and then suddenly the carpenter no longer lives in the village where they live in the town you get what i'm saying and so the vision of labor then makes up for the division of society too um and 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 that's a thing that's not really being considered it's like, oh, no, you just want the society to always be held together, even though it's going to become extraneous, right? Why is this carpenter living in the village anymore? Like, why are they still living in the village? And, and if they want to sell their tables and chairs, then why are they living in the village? You get what I'm saying? Like, if they want to full-time be a carpenter, then why are they, yeah, I would say it again, why are they living in the village? Um... Anyhow, let's uh, go back to this. Um, let's see. Tan Zan came in. She says, morning, Oni. Okay. Well, no, before that. Oh, there was a lot of comments. Ooh, I missed a lot. All right. So Learning Curve says, Ujamaa villages are like the grange for farmers or guilds in Europe. But maybe it be expanded to include other industries with a representative from each industry making national decisions. Yeah, you could do that too. Uh, AL says, the same thing is true about MLK and integration. Now, we don't have to try integration again because we know it would, doesn't work for us. Exactly. You know, um, MLK laid out. He like he believed in it. He did it perfectly. They shot him in the head. You know what I mean? Like, like that tells you all you need to know about, well, well should we go about that route? You know? <laughs> like, it tells you all you need to know. Uh, Learning Curve says, this sounds like worker cooperatives in the modern day, so that each village is self-governing and all those groups are taking care of each other. Each our village is a business with articles of incorporation, rules, and self-regulation. They would get roads and schools built based on the government taxes they pay. Yeah, exactly. You know, and and that's a that's a good model. But again, like you know, when you start talking about like what kind of restrictions you're gonna make on the human economy, as in you know, oh, you can't make somebody else work for you. You can't pay another person to work for you. It really, um, like I feel like it's it's kind of like adding a burden on what would otherwise have been a natural, uh, you know, a naturally balancing situation. Um, uh, or, or it could have been a balancing situation. Or it, would have, it wouldn't have been that harmful, um, ultimately. Tanzan says, morning only. Yeah, so Tanzan, like, 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 like Learning Curve is going to say, great show last night. Um, we, we learned about cults. You know what I mean? Learning Curve, uh, I, like, I like Learning Curve's uh, definition of uh, distinction between leaders and dictators. Um, uh, she just said it like one sentence. It was like, what? What was it? Uh, I think a, 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 a dictator tells you what to do and a leader shows you what to do. You know, and I'm like, Shh, is that show and tell? You already know. All right, Learning Curve says, facts. So all and economic integration does not work because we um, know the nature of our adversary. They have no good intentions, exactly. Um, Ten says, greetings, matron. El, thanks for joining me yesterday. Learning Curve goes on. Greetings, Ten, sister. 
Great show yesterday. You picked an interesting topic. Yeah. EL goes on exactly. Integration makes us guess in someone else's house. Integration into another group leads to the disintegration of our group. Yep. And Tanzan says, and thank you for making an interesting discussion. I learned a lot. Um, EL says, my pleasure. It was a great discussion. Uh, Tanzan says, thanks, EL. I hope you can continue next week. Still much to uncover. Woo. I tell you. All right. Um, so we're going back. Um, arranged, so on and so forth. I think we read this. By such a difficulty, you know, they were arranged by the members according to... Yeah. I try to, like, read up to the end of the paragraph, you know, just so that it's easier to read the next thing. All right. So Jama print socialism in practice. A nation of such village communities would be a socialist nation. For the um, essential element in them would be the equality of all members of the community and the members' self-government in all matters which concerned only their own affairs. For a really socialist village would elect its own officials and they would remain equal members with the others. Subject always due to the wishes of the people, only in relation to work discipline would there be any hierarchy. Hierarchy and such, and then such officials would be merely acting for the village as a whole. Now again, this is another thing too. It's like if you have a big enough government, right, then the the governors won't be able to work the same as the workers you know it's just like he's really trying to impede the human inequality but as the society grows and as the needs of the people become differentiated like that inequality that you're trying to avoid is going to creep up now you could creep everybody at a certain legal living wage but this this but the reality that you're going to have everybody working equally is just not even a thing if you as as division of labor becomes more and more um, divisive in a sense, you know, because uh, like again, like the politician is like if if you're a politician uh, and you're handling like a constituency of ten thousand people, right? Then you have like you know not ten thousand issues a day, but you kind of do. You know what I mean? And then you just can't like handle those ten thousand issues, but also work fourteen hours on the farm, you know. Um, like you just can't, you know. So hey, let us take an example. It would be, it would be a meeting of the villagers, which would elect the officers and the committee, and a meeting of the village, which would decide whether or not to accept or to amend any detailed proposals for work organization, uh, which the committee has drawn up in the light of general directions given by earlier meetings. Let us assume. So again, so you see, you see what I'm saying? Like, like on a small scale, this makes sense. The meeting of the village. And you're going to see, he's going to say 40 members. But what if you have a village of, or if you have a population of 40,000 people? Then it just becomes unwieldy. So he said, let us assume that a 40-member village meeting agrees to a cotton farm of 40 acres and a food farm of 40 acres. It would be the committee's job to propose where in the land available these different crops would be, would be planted and I'll propose the time and organization of joint work on the land. At the same time, the committee would have to make proposals for the other work which has been decided upon, perhaps the digging of a trench for a future piped water supply or the making of a new road or the improvement of village drainage. These detailed proposals they would bring to the uh, next village meeting, and once they had been accepted, it would be a job of the officers to ensure that all members carried out the decisions and to report to all the general meetings any problems that they occurred. As the village became more established and the need for a village carpenter or a village nursery or a village shop becomes more pressing, the committee would work out proposals as to how these could be organized and run by a member of for the community benefit. The village officials would also be responsible for liaising, liaising with other villages and with um, the general machinery of government. Thus, they would be about schooling, credit, agricultural advice, and so on, where the village had decided it needed, as well as arranging the selling of crops, the organization of taxes, payments, etc. Exactly. So look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. So for 40 people in a, in a village, sure, this makes a lot of sense, right? And then you could also see how he's like, well, eventually these same community members are, are then going to start getting more and more work on their plate. Because now they're trying to run the nursery. They're trying to run the shop. They're trying to run the carpentry. And here's another thing, too, to pick up on, right? The village, this one this one village, is looks like it's mostly producing f cotton to sell and food for them to consume, right? Um, what if another village, right, has food for them to sell? 40 acres of, of, of food and then 40 acres of pyrethrum or something, right? 
Now, one of them has 40 acres of cotton, the other one has 40 acres of pyrethrum, right? But let's pretend pyrethrum, but who knows what that is, right? Pyrethrum yields, um, uh, actually, I don't know if pyrethrum is the food, so I'm just going to skip that. Let's say it's 40 acres of, uh, so what was a cash crop? What's a cash crop? Um, tobacco, okay? 40 acres of tobacco and 40 acres of cotton. But let's say, like they said, cotton gives you 40 shillings an acre and um but tobacco gives you 90 shillings an acre right um what happens is this okay the other village is making a lot more money and so while you're distributing among the people you know equally among the farm and equally among the profit let's pretend right the other village is going to be much wealthier than the other one like you can't force the equality thing it's just like how do you do that And, and you could be like, hey, you know what? Turn all the profits to the government. The government just equally distribute the profits to everybody. That's, that's a thing. You could do that. But it's, it's almost like you're hampering yourself from, uh, yeah, it's like, it's like, it's like that, then and that's like that. Like essentially some of the concepts that you would find is that, you know, it might just be better if, you turned your community as a whole towards tobacco as the cash crop. You get what I'm saying? Uh, or, or, or to like make it so that, you know, that cotton farm was making less cotton and more tobacco and, and therefore the price of cotton would go up because there's less of it and the price of tobacco might go down because it's, there's more of it. But, but for what it's worth, you could then regulate, like you can then manage the land in accordance to the market kind of thing it's 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 a it's a complicated you know arrangement but what i'm saying is that you know well among other things is one you have um you have to recognize that you're going to find that inequality of of profit just based off of the the decisions of a farmer right and then two you're going to find the inequality of labor just based off of the need for the village officials to have a bigger and larger um uh, like, 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 have concerns outside of personally growing crops. So it's like you, 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 you couldn't win. You couldn't win. Okay, so let's see. Um, El says, "I hope so too." Yes, there's a lot to discover. Um, he's talking. To, he's talking to Tanzania. Uh, uh Tanzania. <laughs> I call it Tanzania. All right. By such means as these there would be reestablished all the advantages of traditional African democracy, social security and human dignity. And at the same time, we would have prepared ourselves to take advantage of modern knowledge and the advantage which they can bring, advantages which they can bring. For there is no reason why in the course of time, such villages, food villages should not become more than simple agricultural communities, selling their crops and buying everything manufactured from outside. Certain things will always be available more cheaply if they are mass produced, but our estab an established village could easily organize the production of other things for itself. And in cooperation with other nearby villages of the same kind, a system of locally based small industries would be about possible for the benefit of all involved. Thus, a group of villagers, villages together could organize their own service station, servicing station for agricultural implements and farm vehicles. They could perhaps make their own cooking utensils and crackery out of local materials, or they could organize the making of their own clothes on a communal basis. Such villages could also organize together for social, political, and economic educational purposes so as to bring to all members in their rural area some of the opportunities which can come from living in communities. But all of these things would depend upon the democratic decisions of their members themselves. The governments or local authorities would become involved only where a decision involved them in responsibilities, as, for example, in the provision of a teacher if a school were planned or where a proposal might affect the interest of I feel like the provision, sorry, the provision of a teacher if a school were planned or where a proposal might affect the interest of people outside the village or villages directly concerned. So, again, you're going to have to pay a person to be a teacher. You're paying a person to be a teacher, they're not going to be working the land too. You know, you cannot have this rural economy um, and, and like advance in the distribution of labor, the division of labor. Like, you would want this economy if you didn't do the division of labor. But once you start doing the division of labor, you're changing the economy. 
And when you're changing the economy, um, like you have to change the culture with it. You know what I mean? Like obviously not too far, but it's just just a necessary. It's just a necessity. Um, government personnel and the local government would, of course, have a definite role. And of course, you know, I would also say the government would want to do so in the in the capitalist model. The government is going to do the schools and pay the teachers. You know, and that's why a lot of us call the teachers public funds and so forth. But then I mean, like publicly funded. But then the government also pays for the police and the military, um, public safety. You know. And again, those are also people, again, who do not work the land. And I, I, th- and I talked about this earlier. Some of you guys might have missed it. But I talked about this earlier where Jope was saying that um, people say, where Jope was saying that people, Tanzania, you don't have to tell me that anymore. I got it. Um, <laughs> she just keeps telling me, hey, I'm gathering up. I'm gathering up. Like, okay, we got it. Uh, all right, Tanzan, uh, let's shit in my head. Uh, so, like, earlier we were talking about Jope. And so Jope is like, um, you know, a lot of people observed in Africa that the men were working less than the women. And and I said, you know, the reason why is because the men used to be involved in public security or in public war and like, in, 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 like international wars. You know what I mean? And when you're in when you can no longer do public security or international wars, you become unemployed. You know, um, but anyway. Government personnel and the local government would, of course, have a definite role to play in a society organized on the basis of such communal villages, just as each village would be able to do certain things on its own and for others would benefit from cooperating with similar villages nearby. So there are some things in which the nation as a whole has to cooperate. National defense, education, marketing, health, communications, large industries for all these things and many more. All of Tanzania has to work together. The job of government would therefore be to help those these self-reliant communities and to organize their cooperation with others. But it would certainly be easier for the members of the village to take full advantage of these government services and to cooperate with their fellow citizens if they are living and working together in their small groups. An agricultural field worker, for example, would be teaching new techniques to about 40 people together instead of one family at a time. He would thus spend more time and give more expert help to the village farm than he could give ever give to any individual farmer or again government could not hope to get a let me just check my phone oh it's just this thing uh government again government could not hope to give a water pump to every separate house in a scattered community nor provide the miles of pipes which might be necessary in order to service one isolated house but it would be able to cooperate much more quickly in the supply of a pump or pipes for a village of 30 or 40 families who are willing to do the physical labor themselves. The country would also become more democratic uh, through their organization of Ujama communities. Now, okay, democracy is one of the watchwords you want to watch out for. Like, it's really like a Western concept um, at this point. Like, it's like, the, like it's just saying it, you know? Um, but like everything here is Western, obviously. I mean, I mean, I mean, this is like a translation of Swahili, so it's probably going to be Westernized. Um, but yeah, you'd want to be, you'd want to be, um, wary of democracy um i think uh yesterday tanzan's in tanzan's podcast podcast they started talking about democracy versus dictatorship and they made a lot of compelling um reasoning behind dictatorship so you know make sure you guys check out tanzan's channel uh and make sure you subscribe uh the members of parliament let me see the comments are like okay members of Pala the premier of parliament or of the local council would more easily be able to keep informed of the people's wishes and their ideas on national issues if they are living together than if the people do not get a daily opportunity to discuss important issues together. This means that not only would the people be governing their own lives directly in a village matter, but they would also be playing a more effective role in the government or of their country. Um, so let me see, how many more pages do we have? I feel like it should be, oh my gosh, all right, whatever. Um, I'm going to try to go a little quicker. How do we get to this position? Persuasion, not force. It is one thing to argue the advantages of this type of rural organization. The question is, how can we move from our present situation to more make it into a reality? The farmers in Tanzania, like those elsewhere in the world, have learned to be cautious about new ideas, however attractive they may sound. Only experience will convince them, and experience can only be gained by beginning. Yet socialist communities cannot be established by compulsion. It may be possible and sometimes necessary to insist on all farmers in a given area growing a certain acreage of a particular crop until they realize that this brings them a more secure living than do not have to force have this to be forced to cultivate it. So 
so like he does force like he does kind of low-key force people i think um i don't remember that historically but i think that i think he kind of like regrets that um or at least i think there might be propaganda against him for it but anyway but living together and working together for the good of all is not just a question of crop output it depends on a willingness to cooperate and an understanding of the different kinds of life which can be obtained by the participants if the work hard if they work hard together Viable socialist communities can only be established with willing members. The task of leadership and of government is not to try and force this kind of development, but to explain, encourage, and participate. For a farmer may well be suspicious of the government official or party leader who comes to him and says, do this. He will be more likely to listen to the one who says, this is a good thing to do for the following reasons, and I am myself participating with my friends in doing it. Individuals can have, and this is, he's just telling you uh, the way to, it's kind of like what, what, what Revolutionary Mansion was saying yesterday, about the dictatorship, you know, the dictator saying, do this, and the leader saying, this is a good thing, like, you know, showing, I myself am participating with this friend and doing it, and it's kind of just like a, a regular way to, like, he's kind of, he's spitting game to you and telling you how to convince people better, you know, um, so, like, definitely pay attention to everything, you know, individuals can have a very great effect in this work, whether or not they have any official position, government can help to get such communities established by encouragement, and by giving priority and service to those groups who have committed themselves to this type of development. But it is vital that whatever encouragement government and TANU give to this type of scheme, they must not try to run it. They must help the people to run it themselves. Um, again, like peep game. So it would also be unwise to expect that established farmers will be convinced by words, however persuasive. The farmer will have to see for themselves the advantage of working together and living together before they trust their entire future to this organization of life look how important this is this is what i'm trying to tell you guys people are not going to buy into your words or your ideas i think it was cabral who said that nobody follows your ideas they they, they try to follow like because what's at stake for your ideas is the entire future is the is the future you know in particular, before giving up their individual plots of land, they will wish to see that the system of working together really benefits everyone. Groups of young men may be willing to experiment, and this should be welcomed. We must encourage such young people, but we are really aiming at a balanced community where young and old are all involved together. Progress may thus be quite slow at the beginning, yet there is no reason for surrendering the goal. The man who creeps forward inch by inch may well arrive at his destination, but the man who jumps without being able to see the other side may well fall and cripple himself. Um... It's like, yeah, it's okay to be cautious. Step-by-step -step transformation. Where necessary, then, progress can be made in three stages. The first may be to persuade people to move their houses into a single village. It is, if possible, near water. Um, I'm going to see how many pages this this thing. Um, near water and to plant their next year's food crop within easy reach of the area where their houses will be. For some people in Tanzania, this will be quite a change in living habits, so that in certain areas, they will be the second rather than the first stage in the progress. For another step is to persuade a group of people, perhaps the members of a 10-house cell, to start a small communal plot or some other communal activity on which they work cooperatively. Um, let me just type. In which they work cooperatively. I'm just opening the thing on my phone so that I can see how many pages it is. Uh, in which they work cooperatively, sharing the proceeds at harvest time according to the work they each have done. Alternatively, it might be that the parents of children at a primary school start a community farm, working together with the children, and jointly deciding what to grow and how to share out the proceeds. In either of these cases, and whether or not the people are living together in a village at this stage, the people would keep their individual plots. The community farm would be an extra effort instead of each farm family trying to expand its own acreage. Once these two steps have been effected, the final stage would come when the people have confidence in a community farm so that they are willing to invest all their efforts in it, simply keeping gardens around their own houses for special vegetables, etc. Uh, then the socialist village will be really established and other productive community activities can get underway. Um, let me just see. Okay, so it's not... Oh, shit, there's a lot of pages. Okay. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta do the math. You're like, fudge. All right. Um, so anyway, let me see how the family's doing. So, but like, you kind of see how he's he's explaining how we can... Um, how we can create... 
like trust in the community farming. And he's like, you don't just tell people, hey, it's a community farm. You give them case by case steps. And then it's like a scientific way. The same way how I was saying that how the other guy wrote his book. It's like you want people to see, oh, yes, you know what? This community involvement is better than the individual involvement. Now, whether or not it is, I don't know. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, Lenin Curve says a community cannot be built without emotional safety and trust. I heard what you said, but I'm not doing it until I can see what you did. Exactly. All right, this boy is... Stop it. Go go eat your food. All right. Um, all right, so anyway. So, <laughs> like, he's just like, I'm just playing around. All right. It is obvious, however, that with the variations in potential, in soils, and in social customs, it would be absurd to set down one pattern of progress or one plan which must be followed by everyone. What is necessary is the objective of an Ujamaa community. The interim steps and the detailed organization should be adapted to the local circumstances, uh, which include an understanding of the people's traditional attitudes as well as the degree of the people's political understanding and their acceptance of their social objectives. Of the social objectives, the important thing is that the work, and and also notice this. This is 1967. So this is around while well, we were talking about Dr. King earlier. Dr. King was alive during this time, I think. Uh, or like recently, you know, uh, I forgot that he was like assassinated, but I feel like he might have been assassinated in 68 or something, or at least Malcolm X maybe was assassinated in 68. So what I'm saying is that this was like during the time of the American civil rights movement. Um, let me see. I think Dr. King was because it could have been that he was assassinated in 65, honestly. Oh, no, no. So he was assassinated in 68. So Dr. King's alive and pushing the integration at this point in America. And whereas where else he's doing that. Over in Tanzania, uh, this guy is making this real huge social advantage advances on the economy of the land. Uh, this is like the big difference that I'm saying is that what you can accomplish as a good, honest person, you know, in Africa seems to be less bounded and less limited. Because Dr. King was a good, honest man. Malcolm X was a good, honest man, you know, um, and yet... Uh, you know, you see what they like, you see how like the, the level of their conversation in a sense, you know, of, you know, pretty much the white man's bad or whatever, or the white man's good or what have you. And then they get killed regardless. Um, uh, whereas Nere gets to live this full life where he's honestly helping to feed multiple human beings um, at a time. Let me see. Malcolm X was the one. Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965. Shaking my damn head, y'all. Um. Yeah, that sucks. All right, but anyway. Uh, but yeah, this is like around that time. This is around the time. Um, the important thing is that the work should begin. For that is... Like, like, like here we have black men who are able to um, organize economies. And then you had black men who were just kind of like, hey, can I... Can I re like, fuck your economy. Killed. And the other one's like, hey, you know what? Your economy's not that bad. Killed. You know? Uh, yeah, anyway, so the important thing is that the work should begin for there. This is not for it is no use waiting for the Ministry of Land Settlement and Water Development to send out its officers to lay out villages to explain and so on. If this type of organization is to spread, every rural worker who understands the objective must play his part. The Tanu cell leader may in some cases be able to persuade the members in his cell to make a beginning. The agricultural officers may be able to persuade a group of farmers how much more he would be able to help them if they were living and working together. The community development officer who has won the confidence of the people in his area may be e able to do it, or the TANU official at any level. The teacher in a primary school could help, or in any individual Tanzanian who understands if he is a sheikh or a padre, and a whether or not he is, has an official position. The important um, thing is that everyone should understand that this is no alternative to hard work. It is simply a more intelligent and more productive form of hard work, which, if the weather um, is good, will lead to better results for all those participating. Promises of miracles, even promises of great government help, will only lead to disaster. The first few years of Ujama villages, living will be very hard. The facilities, and he's just telling you like an IS is, you know? Um, somebody told me that, <laughs> that uh, according to them, the, the phrase that they heard it is uh, according to a T.I. Tiz or something like that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I've only heard Maddox say and he's from Georgia. This other person's not from Georgia, so it is what it is. So the first year of Ujama Village living will be very hard. The facilities available to the people will not immediately increase by their coming together. 
and there will be new problems of organization and cooperation. The wealth of each village will not be greater than that of the people at present, and the new possibilities, the vision of what can come in the future, may tempt the members to be more dissatisfied than they are at the moment, and to give way to the temptations of impatience. These the socialist society villages must grow from an application of the principle of self-reliance. They must grow through the efforts of their own members, and that means hard work which brings results only after a few years. Only a full realization of the problems as well as the possibilities of Ujamaa communities will enable them to get firmly on their feet. This is why it is so important. I just realized I have to do something. Uh, this is why it is so important. This is why it's so important that each community start should start with a mixture of private and cooperative living if the former has been the custom of the people. Gradually increasing the level of cooperative working as the members sort out the problems which occur and find a method of organizing their communal activities which best suits them. This is not to say that the different ministries of government have no role to play, but the basis of growth of such Ujamaa communities and of their strength can only be work and the understanding of participants. Government advice and help can only be of marginal importance. It must be not be expected everywhere for if all our own if our, if all our two million families started such communities, it would clearly be impossible to help all their schemes at once. Even without everyone starting such schemes, the government will um, not be able to give much help to any one that is established. Uh, distribution of returns in Njama village. Yeah, I, I, I kind of might have not been, you know, I might have done this. All right. Distribution of returns in Njama village. So here's important too. Also important that the principles on which any return from the community farm will be distributed should be just, simple, and easily understood from the beginning. The basis must be to share according to the work done, for although in a family everyone shares equally whether they turn out for work every day or not, energetic people who understandably be unwilling to carry lazy people who are not members of their own family. Yet at the same time, some proportion of the total return, at least once the village is properly established, should be set aside to help those in genuine difficulties, the sick, the crippled, the old, and the orphaned children. So he's like, look, energetic people will work more than lazy people, but they're not really willing to um, like, give to lazy people what they themselves have, haven't done. And that's like some saying, like, you see the inherent, you know, inequality and, and he's just kind of like, no, no, no. But it's, it's just a thing, you know, it's just a thing. It is also important that from the beginning, the idea of putting some part aside for expansion or investment should be accepted. When the farm first begins, it must be possible in certain places for most of the returns to be devoted to communal purposes like buying pipes for water supply or building a new classroom, a community center, and so on. This will be especially true while people keep their individual plots, although even here some personal return commensurate to the work done will probably be necessary. All such decisions, however, how to share out as well as how much to grow, the arrangements for the children, the crippled and old, must be made by the agreement of all the participants. So again, when it, when it when it's only forty members, it's it's easier to say, hey, everybody agree. When it becomes forty thousand people, it doesn't. Village democracy must operate from the beginning. There is no alternative if this system is to succeed. A leader will have an opportunity to explain his ideas and to try to persuade the people that they are good, but it must be for the people themselves to accept or reject his suggestion. It does not matter if the discussion takes a long time. We are building a nation. So it doesn't matter if the discussion takes a long time. And again, it's like, how many people are equipped to have these, these discussions at length? Who has the time? If we have a real issue, a real problem, who has the time? You know, if, if you look at the American um, body of law, you know, they're discussing things like, should you do fracking in this community? And based off of what science do you going to do this fracking? And do you have an independent scientific body? And is this independent scientific body getting paid by the people who do fracking? You know, it's, it's, it's like there's so much. And you have to, you have to, you have to appropriately um, lay out a scale for it. And if you're not, if you're not laying out a scale for a larger, you know, a larger system, then you're, you're paralyzing yourself. You're paralyzing yourself to a, to a small system. We are building a nation, and this is not a short-term thing. For the point about, and that's what I'm saying, is you're building a nation, and it's not a short-term thing. So you can't continually say, hey, you know what? What works for 40 people is what's going to work for, for 40 million people. Because it's not. 
and you could say 40 you know 40 million people are just 10 you know are just uh, a million f- f- a million groups of 40 people but it's not you know it's it's like the the old adage you know the some of its parts is whatever i don't know but you, you know the 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 yeah, the whole, I don't know. All right, anyway, Learning Curse is a community cannot be built without, oh, no, sure, I read that. Um, yeah, so, all right, that's it. Um, we are building a nation, and this is not so on and so forth, right, uh, for short term. For the point about decisions by an Ajama village is not just whether the members do or do not decide to dig a well or clear a new Shamba. The point is that by making this decision and then acting upon it, they'll be building up a whole way of life, a socialist way of life. Nothing is more important than that. And that's what I'm saying. There's things more important than that. And it's not the work for a few days nor of a few people. An Ajama village is the village of the members, and the life there is their life. And the life there is their life. Therefore, everything which relates exclusively to the village and their life in it must be decided by them and not by anyone else. So special problems, local land shortages. So there are, however, some areas where local land shortages make it impossible to move towards cooperative living and working through the openings of entirely new community farms. In such areas as Kilimanjaro, for example, every piece of land is already intensively cultivated with barely enough open spaces left for public purposes like schools, community centers, and so on. Furthermore, these areas are almost always farmed on the basis of individual plots, usually with each farmer living on his own plot and not in villages with his neighbors. In areas like these, there is already a social problem. Young men and women find that there is no work for them to do on their father's land and no place where nearby where they can start to farm on their own. Up to now, they have, as a result, tended to drift to the towns looking for wage employment, which they are often unable to find. There is no easy answer to this. The only answer is through new settlements in other areas. It is impossible to expand the land on the mountain, and the only way forward for the growing population is to go get some other part of Tanzania and start afresh. This is necessary whatever form of agricultural production is an organization is adopted. Government must help the extra population from these areas to settle and to farm. In the future, however, this assistance for, su- for resettlement should be on the basis of settlement in villages which can develop into Ujamaa communities. This does not mean that the government should build modern expensive houses and complete villages for the new settlers to move into that assumption has been our mistake in the past instead we must organize two moving days the first should be during the beginning of the dry season when active men and women are taken to the new area and loan tents for a few weeks while they build temporary houses for themselves and their families who will move in later and begin land clearing ready for the rains when accommodation is ready the second moving day should be instituted with the families brought to bring begin their new life in the village for those people and again like kind of like what learning curve says find your people and move in together you know you could set up a uh like i know for instance that some african housing complexes like some comp- housing complexes in africa like or even in america anywhere really um there are like plots of land that are going to have homes on them and you could select those and say, you know what, as a collective, as a group, we're going to select those plots of land. We're going to now in his in, in the other case, he's telling them to build the houses themselves. But it could be that somebody else is building the houses and, and, and so on and so forth. You have a community design. You have a community designer. They design the community. They build the houses and then you just move in someday and you establish a village life like that. Um, anyway, uh, and anybody could do that. So for those people whose relatives cannot help them. The government should provide food until the first harvest. It should also provide simple tools on credit and be prepared to provide credit for poles, permanent roofing, etc. for the houses and give a grace period of three years before repayment begins. In such settlements, too, it would be essential that agricultural advice be available because the farmers would be unfamiliar with the crops and the soil requirements of the new area. It is the circumstances like these that the government should try to provide a community development officer or a Tanu official familiar with the potential of living and working together who would help the new settlers in the initial organization of their village communities, uh, communities, etc. Even so, if the new settlers came from areas of exclusively private farms, it would be a mistake to exclude individual plots at the beginning. Some large areas of the land should be reserved for a community farm. But if the settlers um, so wish... Uh, but if the settlers so wish, they should be allowed to clear first, although as a group, the land which they will each cultivate privately. In order to avoid the need for big capital investment, it is also necessary that the first effort should be made in the direction of the village growing its own food. Land clearing and planting of cash crops should be the second priority, not the first. 
yeah, so he's like, land clearing and cash crops should be the second priority. First proper priority um, is grow, grow your own food. And that's what I think is, is really sickly what we have to decide for ourselves as African people is, is to um, grow our own food, more or less. Uh, let me just double check when... Uh, it looks like we got an email, but let me see. Okay, so we're almost... Well, we're, we're, coming, we're coming through. The need for new settlements should, from areas of hand shortage... Or from land shortage. Sorry, my hand, my, my thing was in the way. Land shortage uh, does not mean that the land shortages, shortage areas should be excluded from socialist development. It must be accepted, however, that socialist progress in these areas will be more difficult to achieve. For when vacant land is not available, there is only one way to create a community farm, and that is by individual farms coming together and joining their pieces of land and working them in common. Furthermore, many of these areas are under permanent crops like coffee. A farmer entering an Ajama village under these circumstances will thus be investing at least part of his existing capital in the new project, not simply investing his effort in making an expanded farm. This will mean that a greater amount of socialist and technical education will be necessary before the first steps are undertaken, for the farmer must be convinced that working together with others, pooling his coffee trees with others, will still bring greater benefits to himself and his family. Again, people are looking for profit, right? Already. That's the thing. People are already looking for profit. They're selling coffee, not because they like coffee, but because they realize there's a profit in selling coffee. Right now, whether or not that's the not like what, like, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean is, is the question, you know, uh, like, do we say, OK, African people stop selling coffee? Or do we say, OK, since you're selling coffee for profit, then then what, you know? It may be that the way to start under these circumstances, and basically he's saying just don't leave the Maasai behind, but anyway, and, and the socialist agenda, but of course, why does anybody have to go to the socialist agenda is the question. It may be that the way to start under these circumstances is to operate first on the basis of working groups, but with the individual plots retained, that is, on the basis of mutual help. This would be simply a revival and perhaps an extension of the traditional system of joint activity, making it applicable to existing farms and not just to land clearing or house building. By working together on their private farms, the farmers will be able to finish different jobs more quickly or to do things which would be too difficult for any of them individually. This will then have time to do other useful things, either by themselves or cooperatively. The first step of mutual help can be followed by others. Um, the farmer could buy certain essential goods cooperatively, things like fertilizers, for example, or they could together build a store for their coffee or something else which is of no use to them all. By doing such things together, the farmer will be gradually moving towards an acceptance of Ujamaa socialism. In areas of land shortages like this, the way for people to begin to work together may, however, not be in agriculture at all. Indeed, now instead, a group of them may come together to start a small industrial or service project in which they all work for the good of all. Thus, for example, in Kilimanjaro, a group of farmers may get together and jointly organize and run a modern poultry unit or a communal tannery or a communal work wood workshop. Or again, they may come together to share the use of a truck, which they jointly own, or to organize some new irrigation, perhaps with a water wheel, which they jointly own, which will benefit all of them. If people start working together in this way, it will be possible for these densely populated areas to become areas of rural industrialization, thus reducing their dependence on world prices of their cash crops, and also providing a new impetus to community activity and community life. He's like... Um, working together in debt and so forth, become areas of rural industrialization. It's like, essentially, you, you don't want to be dependent on world prices of cash crops and so on and so forth. Uh, because the reality is this, you start selling tobacco and one year it's 90%, uh, 90 shilling uh, an acre, uh, or 90 shilling a pound, and the next year it is um, 30 shilling a pound, right? And so what happens is that if your life depended on the 90 shilling a pound, you now have a third of, of your life. Um, and then you have to start going into your own savings and all that kind of stuff, uh, if you have any. And if you don't, then you start to suffer. Um, uh, so anyway, so the rural industrialization projects must not be thought of in terms of large modern factories, but more in terms of cottage industries. Yet it would be a mistake for such work to be done by separate families in their own homes. Uh, if the shirt making or the knitting of wet sweaters and blankets is to be the project for a particular group, they should work together in one place so that they can help each other 
and each specialized on certain aspects of the work. Neither should great capital investment be considered. We have many traditional manufacturing activities which we can revive, which we should revive. Government also intends to take further steps which we, which we will hope, hope will, in a year or so, enable advice and ideas to be given to people in circumstances like these. Well, the important thing is that such village industries must be organized and run on the same basis as community farms, that is, with the members making their own decisions, selecting their own officers, and sharing their proceeds in accordance with what they themselves believe to be justice. Um, so animal husbandry areas. Uh, another special problem may well occur in those areas where animal herding is an important economic activity, if not the only one. So again, you have, he's, 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 he's saying... Look, we have this agricultural, like we have community, we have village life, and I want to change everything in Africa to the village life model. But there is the individual farm model. There is the cash crop model in Kilimanjaro, and now he's going to talk about there is the herding model, which has nothing to do with the traditional village model. And so usually, or normally, you'd say, leave them alone, right? You'd just say, leave them alone. But instead of saying, leave them alone, he's like, no, the animal, the, the people in Kilimanjaro, Let's let's change them, and now he's saying let's change the and and it seems like he might be saying let let's let's see what he says about the animal herders. So he says another special problem may well occur in those areas where animal herding is an important economic activity, if not the only one. Certainly, no one can expect that all the farmers in such an area will straight away merge their herds into the common pool. But here too, we can start gradually and build up socialist herding step by step, while the farmers learn the full benefits of it. First, we can start by mutual help in herding. The herders will mix up a group of farmers' cattle and take them all out together, so that a smaller number of people are out at any one time. This, in fact, is quite customary for many of our people, and it would be comparatively simple to introduce a system where it has died out or never been practiced. And it will mean that each farmer will have a little more time to do other work, um, either on his own or, better still, in cooperation with others for the benefit of the community as a whole. Another method of advance is for a number of cattle owners each to contribute one or two heads of cattle so as to make up a community herd, which is then cared for by modern methods and which preserve, perhaps has a reserved grazing area. Each farmer would at this stage also keep his own herd, but gradually the improvement of the community herd and the visible experience of communal benefits from it will probably lead them to build up the community herd and reduce the size of their separate cattle ownership. The participants would, of course, use the income from the community herd as they please. They may decide to use the milk for school feeding. They may decide that the income from the herd should be used to build a cattle dip or a dam, which will provide regular water for people and cattle alike. Or they may decide to spend the income on improving the village or helping those members of their community who are in some kind of trouble. In both of these special circumstances, the move into a village, the move into a village so that people live together as well as work together may have to be accomplished gradually um, but until it is done real democratic and socialist living is impossible uh, so yeah let me what was it again? Uh, okay uh, so a very important fact about the methods of gradual progress into a drama so problems of capital so he's like this is another problem of capital so basically you, you guys picked up on it he's like there are herders and we're going to change them into communal herders, right? Which is not really that bad. It's just it's just a matter of, you know, how how much are you trying to transform people, you know, and why, you know, um, like why? But is whatever, right? A very important fact about this method of gradual progress into Ujamaa, and it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Let me see what the comments are like. Um, it's not that bad. Uh, let's see. So we have some more comments. All right, so. El says emerging quantities. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, complexities. These are the emerging qualities. The com complexity emerges with a greater number of people. Exactly. You know, like when you have like a, just a family, like it's just me and my son, right? When you have that, it's not that complicated. Like, what's the what? What do we want to eat? What do we want to do? What do we want to read? What do we want to so on and so forth? But if you had me and uh, me, uh, a wife, and, and, and 10 kids, it's just a little bit, like, we can't do the same, hey, what do you want? Oh, we got it. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, what do, what do 10 people want? You know? What, is the, what does the wife want? You know what I mean? And then, like, even that, it's like, we want to go on vacation or something. It's just, like, so much. It just, 
it just becomes a lot more complicated. You know, it just becomes a lot more complicated. Um, um, problems of capital. So he says, a very important fact about this method of gradual progress into drama communities is that there is no necessity for great capital investment before they can start. They can be, and except when a completely new area is being started up to deal with people moving from overpopulated areas should be started by the people from their own efforts. New land can be cleared by people using their own tools, the tools they use now on their individual plots. Often they themselves will be able to provide the seed for the community farm from their own stocks, or they can get in advance for the purchase of seed, fertilizer, etc. from their cooperative society or perhaps from the National Development Credit Agency. On this basis alone, they can start, and the first year's profits from the community farm can then be used to purchase uh, simple tools, perhaps an ox plow, and so on, for expanded community efforts in the coming years. Again, and by the way, there's like maybe one more page after this. Um, anyway, again, if there are savings and credit society existing in this area, there should and there should be encouraged whether or not there is an Ojama community. The members of the society may agree to lend their savings for the purpose of starting or expanding an Ojama community. The important thing is that there should be no reliance on great outside capital injection. We have already seen in the original government settlement schemes the great danger of heavy initial capitalization and the great burden of debt which it leaves for the farmers. And the truth is that in any case, our nation does not have large amounts of capital. We have to create our own, and we can do this if the work together, using at a beginning simply the resources we already have, that is the labor, our land, and our willingness to work together. So again, you don't want to take out loans. Um, and I think if you guys want, I'm, 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 I mean, I already read this book, but I want you guys to look into um, Garvey's message to the people go back and listen to when I was talking about that one too. But um, message to the people includes the, the reality that you shouldn't take out loans, you know, uh, or why you shouldn't. Now, obviously there are circumstances where you would need to, um, but it's essentially kind of what um, Niede is saying as well. And, and, and I want to say that, that, you know, like I said, he's a frugal person. He's a cheap person. And, you know, you got to appreciate him for that. Um, so the role of government. Oh, look, it says conclusion. Woo. The role of government. So Ujamaa villages will have to be established and will grow through the self-reliant activities of our people. They'll be created. And, and the thing is this. It's not some, it seems like it's theoretical. It seems like it's something that any of us would have written of, oh, this is what, this is what it needs to be. This is how it should be. This is how it's supposed to work. It's theoretical, but it's also practical. And it was practiced. And he's sharing to us what his findings are and how it worked. So that's like you have to give the man his props. It's just like if you guys read, if you ever read Dr. King's writing, he's telling you, like, like, and that's the thing about Dr. King. Dr. King got results. He got results. Notwithstanding the fact that they're just, um, you know, integrationist results, he got, he got black hole jobs. You know? Uh, on top of that, you know, say what you will, a lot of us are, um, a lot of people are, you know, enjoying the uh, integration, per se. Um now, whether, yeah, a lot of people are enjoying integration because the segregation was, you know, it's like, it's not like you had separation. You had segregation and segregation was, you know, uh, pretty bad for black folk, you know? Like, like this idea of, oh, well, you know, I have internet and um, I have a microphone and all that kind of stuff. Like, realistically, under segregation, you probably wouldn't be able to get internet. You know what I mean? Um, like, like, at all. Now, nobody has internet during that time, but just, just realistically, the way how that society was going, uh, black people were going to be excluded from the uh, the mainstream economy, kind of, you know? Um, yeah, so, you know, like, like I mean, like, for the most part, black folk do like the mainstream economy, notwithstanding, you know? Uh, like, like we like Martin and, and all the TV shows of the 90s and all that kind of stuff. But remember that those were TV shows of the 90s. Which means that the '80s like barely had anything. The '70s, you know, '60s, you know what I mean? Uh, '50s, '40s. Now those are the times before the integration movement, right? They just didn't have you at all. You know what I mean? Uh, so today, anyway, role of government. Ujamaa villages will have to be established, and I'm not saying that integration is good because it's not, but um, I'm just letting you know that, uh, um, like, yeah, the world changed, notwithstanding. You know, so so you could say Dr. King. You know, it was whatever, but it's still like the world changed. You know what I mean? Uh, let me see what the comments are like. 
Uh, I still, I, I want to commit this to memory though. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. I wanna, I wanna commit that to memory. But I, I don't, I doubt I will. But I, I want to. So Jama villages will have to be established and will grow through the self-reliant activities of our people. They'll be created by the village people themselves and maintained by them. It must be done for their own resources. The government's role is to help people to make a success of their work and their decisions. Further, where a village community has been established, the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives should ensure that the necessary agricultural advice and the best crops to plant on the community farm and how to plant them for greater success is available to the villagers. Necessary in a large village, an agricultural field officer could be stationed permanently so that his advice is available whenever required. Alternatively, if this is a member of the scheme who is qualified to receive special training, the ministry must provide training for him. It must make available a place at an existing institution or run special courses for such people. Now, again, we could probably do this stuff with the internet. So this is actually a good idea. And I'm thinking about it. Like, like you can have like the whole map of Africa and its agricultural, you know, output, you know, plotted out, you know, not just through artificial intelligence, but just through data collection. And then from that, you know, have the ministry, so on and so forth. And people can do this remote really and virtually. And again, when you have remote work and virtual work, you can also realize that the equality of men and women could be, um, or, or, or like the equal labor of men and women could also be um, realized, at least in those fields, you know. Uh, but anyway, so the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, too, must be active in these villages. Their field workers should be available to help the people to organize themselves, to advise them or how they can become eligible for advance, ad, advances for seed or for small loans for farm equipment. It would be this ministry, too, which, would, which should draw up a model constitution for the village is at different stages, although it may be stressed, must be stressed that no one model should be imposed on any village. Any model which is drawn up should just be a guide which draws the attention of the people to the decisions which has to be made by them. Each village community must be able to make its own decisions. Nevertheless, nonetheless, the experience of existing Ujama villages, such as those now operating within the Ruvuma Development Association, could be helpful, and the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development should try to make this experience available to people from the different parts. But the most important thing is not that the government should do this or that for all villagers, uh, but that within its resources it should give priority to requests which are received from villages where the people are living together and working together for the good of all. Conclusion. What is here being proposed is that we in Tanzania should make from being, from being a nation of individual peasant producers who are gradually adopting the incentives and the ethics of the capitalist system. Instead, we should gradually become a nation of Ujamaa villages where the um, people cooperatively direct in small groups and where these small groups cooperate together for joint enterprises. This can be done. We already have groups of people who are trying to operate the system in many parts of our country. We must encourage them and encourage others to adopt this way of life too. It is not a question of forcing our people to change their habits. It is a question of providing leadership. It is a question of education. And if it's a question of all of us together making a reality the principles of equality and freedom which are enshrined in our policy of Tanzanian socialism. The end. Um, so what I'm going to do, obviously, is I'm just going to show you guys my book just so that I could, you know, um, have something in the background while I read the remaining comments. But it looks like there's no comments. So, um, yeah, I'll just tell you guys. If anybody has any comments for the, today, other than that, um, we don't have to. I will say I probably will not read another book on a daily after this because um, I, I do. I should get back to reading um, Wealth of Nations, but I don't think you guys want to hear Wealth of Nations. Um, and I want to read Wealth of Nations just so that I can have a book, um, like just so I can start writing another book, you know, because um, I have all these ideas, but I want to like just finish, get this thing out of my way and, you know, be perfectly informed on what the economy is that the Westerner has. Uh, before we start talking about the economy that we need to have, uh, just 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 for the breadth of it alone, because like I said, there's a lot of concepts that I don't even know about, um, like um, bounties and uh, something else, like like they're kind of like tariffs or whatever. You know, it's just a lot of economic terms that you want to um, you want to consider that we don't really get to consider because of how lackluster our own communities are or our own conscious community is now. Whether now I obviously want to obviously read a economics book for from an African perspective, but um, 
but like this like, like that's another thing i want to do so uh but i just have to like get through this book that i'm already reading to read another book anyway uh appreciate everybody for coming through and listening I'll, i might as well shout out the i think it was like four participants so we have learning curve uh obviously learning curve excellence make sure you guys check her out on mondays uh trigger happy plus trigger happy 262 plus uh great brother um uh el another great brother uh el is like actively listening too you know what i mean so like appreciation for that and tanzan good sister great sister let's say that right and uh she's available on tuesdays and they're, they're all a part of the kws radio network so um that's really fascinating that's just good and like i said this is the book that i write i wrote um and hopefully I can write another. But in the meantime, in between time, you guys check this one out. Check out the other ones I wrote, too. Um, and I think you'll be better for it. So if that's all that I can say, there's no other comments. I guess I'll just leave you guys to it. Thank you so much for joining me. Shami Amahotep. Ankh Uja Seneb Neb. Amen. Ma'at. Dua. Nature.